Hey everybody, Chris, the old ass retro gamer, back with part four of my film collection live stream. Today I'm going to be talking about all the movies, the Blu-rays, the 4K UHDs, and the 3D Blu-rays in my collection right now that uh, are between the letters E and G. I uh, did all the box sets in the first stream, the box sets, the DVDs, and the uh, TV on home media type stuff. Did A through B in one stream. Last time was C through D. Today is E through G. Um, yeah. Uh, welcome, one up woman. Glad to see you here already. Thank you very much for showing up. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to keep these short. They don't always turn out that way. <laughs> um, I'm trying to keep these under two hours, but each time I tend to go over a little bit. So I'm sorry. But that's just the way it goes. I can talk about movies all day and night if I really, really wanted to. Uh, but I'm going to, like I said, try to keep this under two hours tonight, hopefully. So um, have a lot of movies to talk about tonight. I got three decently sized stacks and one smaller one. I also have some movies that I have picked up uh, since the last stream that fell into the categories I've previously talked about in the other ones. So I'll show those off first and go straight into these other movies, E through G. How about that? All right, so uh, last time I, or in the first uh, stream I did based on my phone collection, I was talking about the box sets. Well, um, Captain Algebra had texted me on Facebook and said, hey, did you know that Target is doing another buy two, get one free sale? And I was like, no, I didn't. Uh, I don't, I haven't, I hadn't checked Twitter that day. I do, uh, I am like following Cheap Ass Gamer and usually I do follow the sales when he posts them. I didn't see any from that day, so it just completely went, you know, past me. And uh, I went and checked it out, and it was not only for video games, which I did get some, it was also for movies. So I bought, you know, I did two games, got a game for free, bought two movies, got a movie for free. The one that I got for free is actually a pre-order that probably won't show up until next month. But one of the two that I did get, one of them is later on in the alphabet, you'll see that different, uh, different stream. Uh, but I picked up the Apocalypse Now Final Cut 40th Anniversary six disc edition um i did say in the a through b stream when i talked about my blu-ray copy of apocalypse now that there were three cuts of the movie i couldn't remember what the third one was i was like there's the theatrical cut there is the uh, redux cut which was what was on the uh, blu-ray that i did have it was the theatrical and the redux and there was a third one i could not remember and that is the final cut uh, i had not watched this yet like i said just showed up the other day uh, but yeah, this has six discs. Uh, it has the all three versions of the movie on it, and it also has that documentary. Did it freeze up again? What is really? Let's see if it corrects itself. Ain't this some shit? Good job program. I will be back.
Well, my computer pooped the bed. Uh, I had to reboot the whole computer and all that. Luckily, this program I used, the last image that was being sent through the stream stays up there. So you just saw the coming or the beginning soon picture. Oh, God. Sometimes my computer ticks me off. Anyway, before my computer pooped itself, I was talking about the final cut of Apocalypse Now. So the last, in the A through B stream, I talked about how I have the theatrical cut and the Redux cut in one set, but there was another cut of the movie out there that I was aware of, couldn't remember the name of it, uh, and then I found this sale through Captain Algebra, and I saw this 4K and Blu-ray version that has all three versions of the movie. It has the theatrical, the, the Redux cut, and the final cut, as well as the Heart of Darkness documentary that I also mentioned in that stream. Uh, which is a feature-length documentary all about the making of this film and you know the crap that went on, the craziness that went on. It's a great movie. It's uh, kind of harsh, uh, hard to watch at times, but it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. So I was happy to repurchase this one in 4K. I can't wait to see what it looks like in 4K and see what was changed for the final cut. So there was that. And the other one I picked up I got just yesterday, and it is uh, the 4K version of Bad Boys for Life. This is the third Bad Boys movie. I talked about the first two movies in the box set stream. Uh, I have those in a box set. And uh, this took, what, 18 years to come out? <laughs> 17 years, I think? Uh, yeah, the two actors, you know, you got Martin Lawrence and uh, Will Smith. They're showing their age a little bit, but they still got it because, honestly, I think this is the best movie of the three that they've made. Uh, the first two, I've never thought of them as anything but little goofy popcorn action movies there's really nothing going on in them uh not known for the acting it's just the action and the the women's butts all over the place and the cinematography and all that kind of stuff uh but this is the first one that actually has a story has character development and and has all the action also and this one has been imax imax enhanced so i'm assuming that parts of it were shot with an imax camera so it'll probably fill up my entire 4k tv when i watch it i haven't seen it since the theater which i loved so, glad to add this to the collection. Like I said, that's my favorite of the three movies. Anyway, so now let's just get into the A through G. That was just the new stuff that I had picked up since the last stream that fell in within the stuff I've already talked about in the other streams. So, A or sorry, E through G, we got E.T., Extraterrestrial. Uh, the Anniversary Edition, I don't know which Anniversary Edition this is. It doesn't really say how many years it has been since between this release and the theatrical release. Uh, but... Loved this movie as a kid, like absolutely loved it. It made me cry, it made me laugh, it made me, you know, get excited and all that kind of stuff. And then like, teen years, like I saw this in the theater, I think twice. It just came out in 82, I was probably 7. Uh, so, saw it in the theater like twice, absolutely loved it, watched it a lot as a kid. And then like through my teen years and into my 20s, I was just kind of like, I don't need to watch that saccharine crap. I'll watch The Thing. That's an alien movie. <laughs> and then uh, ended up just randomly purchasing this. One day I found it at Half Price Books Dirt Cheap. And I was like, oh, I haven't watched that in probably 15 some odd years. Uh, let's check it out again. And I watched it and I was like, that is a well-made, well-acted, uh, little, you know, heartwarming type film. And uh, there's some stuff in it that I still think is kind of... <clears throat> and this also, I do believe, is the version that... Uh, what's his name? Steven Spielberg went in and tried to fix it at one point to try to make it less violent, and he special editionized it like Lucas did for the Star Wars movies uh, by taking the guns out of the cops' hands and putting like walkie-talkies in them and stuff like that. This is the despecialized version. So yes, the cops are standing there with the guns again. I don't think any of that extra footage that they mixed back into the movie with the CGI version of ET is in here at all. I think it's just the standard theatrical cut. I do believe. Yes, it does have the deleted scenes and stuff like that. So, I mean, I can still see that stuff that was added back into those cuts, but I don't have to actually watch it in the film, which is what I do not want to do. Anyway, moving on. We have... This movie has a confusing title. Because it has two. It has the theatrical cut, and or the theatrical title, and then when it came to home video, because the movie pretty much bombed at the box office, uh, them trying to be like, oh, look, we're going to give it this really edgy name. Uh, because I do believe that is what it is called, because this is based on a comic book, and uh, like a manga. And I think that's the title they were trying to give it on home video, was the manga's title. And no one is really buying it, because if you look at the edge, 
this movie has two titles on the edge. It has Live, Die, Repeat, which is the original manga title, and then Edge of Tomorrow was what it was called theatrically. Anyway, I call it Edge of Tomorrow because that's what it was released under. Um, it is, this is the 3D Blu-ray edition. I did not see this in the theater on, uh, in th or, I didn't see this in the theater in 3D. I saw it in standard with my friends. Um, but it's a really awesome, clever Tom Hank or Tom Hanks, wow, Tom Cruise sci-fi action movie, uh, where it's basically Groundhog Day with aliens, where Tom Cruise is, I, I think he was like a propaganda uh, the guy who'd like spin would spin propaganda for the military and he pissed somebody off and they kind of threw him into the military to see how he handles it and he gets basically dropped into like the war that is this big war with these aliens that were, were having on the beach and uh, he is completely out of his league he does not know how to handle himself at all and he accidentally gets splashed with alien blood and it like makes him relive that same day over and over again and you get to see the progression of his character because he starts off as kind of an arrogant douchey type of guy and he ends up becoming like a decent person he ends up falling in love um he ends up becoming a badass warrior the things he does with this like exosuit thing that he wears is just fantastic and it's just really really clever like you see him like give up at one point and he just keeps on killing himself over and over again because then when he when he dies is when the loop begins again um, and as long as he has the alien blood in him, he can keep on reliving it until, like they said, don't ever let, if you ever die or get injured in one of these loops, don't get your, don't get a blood transfusion because you'll end the loop. Um, and it's pretty fantastic. It's clever. It's fantastic action. It's great. I absolutely love it. And they are now, because it came, it became a huge hit on video and streaming and all that, that they are talking about making a actual sequel to it. Movie that bombed at the box office is getting a sequel. Stranger things have happened. Uh, Edward Scissorhands, one of the few... Well, I liked Tim Burton's movies from the past. Uh, I think, like, Mars Attacks is the last one of his movies that I actually liked. I haven't really liked anything he's made past that. Uh, but Edward Scissorhands, I saw in the theater. I knew I was going to be in for something different because he had done Batman... And I think this was his follow-up after Batman. And it is a completely different movie. This is actually like a fantasy romance drama with a, with touches of comedy. Uh, and Johnny Depp plays the title character who has scissors for hands and all that. He's actually an unfinished, like, robot person, I think. <laughs> I can't remember. I think he was a robot at first, but he ended up becoming human. But this creator died before he had a chance to actually give him human hands. So he still kind of has the robot hands which are scissors and stuff. But it's a really well-shot, well-acted movie. It's got a lot of Tim Burton sensibilities in it, which back then I thought were cool and different and quirky. Uh, now it's just kind of just become uh, cliche, I want to say. But this is a fantastic movie. And it's good when Johnny Depp doesn't say a lot in his movies. Um, I've This is one of those movies I bought sight unseen. I say, I've said this the last few streams that i don't buy my movies sight unseen i only buy movies i like um but every once in a while it does happen and this was one of them uh, i'm a huge john carpenter fan and there are maybe three john carpenter movies i have never actually gotten around to watching and they're like the really old ones the early ones and scream factory shot factory was having a sale on their website and it was basically like here's all the john carpenter movies that we own the rights to we're gonna put them all up for sale you know like like what was it 10 15 percent off or something so i bought like six of them and one of them was elvis <laughs> i'm not a big elvis fan but john carpenter made a tv movie all about elvis starring kurt russell as elvis presley and uh, i never saw this movie back in the day when it was broadcast when it's been repeated i never saw it on home video at any point so I was just kind of like, well, you know what? I got this for, I think, $10, so why not? So it's still sealed. I still have not had a chance to sit down and watch it. Uh, I might actually do that uh, 4th of July weekend since, you know, I get an extra day off uh, that weekend. So that'd be kind of cool. But I love Kurt Russell, and I think he would make a fantastic Elvis. So I'm looking forward to watching this. I just have not gotten around to doing it yet, which kind of sucks. The other one that I had never seen that I bought sight unseen in that sale, you'll see, like, way later. Uh, here's a 90s classic that stars a bunch of people who were nobodies at the time and ended up becoming like huge stars down the road. We have Empire Records. So this was... I always kind of said that this was kind of like... 
Clerks. But I think this came out before Clerks. Or whatever. Um, it's basically about a bunch of, like, teenagers uh, who work at a record store. And, like, all the drama that goes on with, you know, them. Like, one of them wants to commit suicide. One of them's a hoe. One of them is, like, trying to save herself. She's, like, the virginal good girl. And she's trying to save herself for this pop star that's coming to uh, the store to sign albums that day. And all that kind of... It's just ridiculous. <laughs> but it's really funny. The characters are likable. It stars a very young Liv Tyler. A very young Renee Zellweger. Uh, you've got uh, Robin Tunney. You've got Ethan Embry. Um... Uh, Rory Cochran, who I think was on like one of those CSI type shows. I uh, don't remember the other guy. Uh, but it has a great cast, and like I said, they're all likable. It is funny. It is very quotable at times. It is also very melodramatic and kind of hokey and kind of stupid and preachy. Uh, but it is fun, and it is like a time capsule movie. It has a lot of great music in it. Uh, the first time I ever heard that song, Plowed. Uh, I can't remember by the, the name of the band, though. They, I remember the album cover had candy corn on it, <laughs> but whatever. It's a it's a time capsule movie. I still enjoy watching it, but I do roll my eyes quite a bit while I'm watching. I was like, yeah, they thought that was a good idea. I was like, ugh. All right. Anyway, Ender's Game. Uh, I read the book that this is based on. It took I don't know how long, like almost forty years, for this to get turned into a movie or whatever. Uh, and I just never got around to seeing it in the theater. I really wanted to. I was really looking forward to it, but it came and went so fast because this bombed hard why would you release like a 150 million dollar science fiction special effect heavy movie in like october that's like horror movie season you release this in april you release this in may that's what you do or maybe even august uh so they effed up on the release date and it bombed because of it because people want to watch horror movies in october including myself i'm not really into going to see a science fiction or like a cerebral science fiction movie but basically it's all about Earth's at war with this alien race. We can't beat them. We've tried. We can't. We we're constantly failing in our counterattacks and all that. So we start training these young kids who are like brainy uh, to come up with alternate solutions. And it's all about the training of this one kid whose last name is Ender. I think his last name is Ender. This is his first name. I cannot remember if it was his first name or his last name. It's been so freaking long whatever anyway um and it's it's the book is definitely better they do have to cut some some things out but a lot of the stuff that was awesome in the book like the zero g training facility area that's in there the way the movie ends is like perfect it's exactly the way the book does and it's just as heartbreaking when you read the when you see it in the movie as when you read it in the book i absolutely loved it the special effects are fantastic um, it does set itself up for a sequel. There are like six books, six or seven books in this series. Yes, the author of these books turned out to be a complete douchebag. Uh, but I will say that he came up with a pretty cool idea for a series of novels. And I was hoping we would get a sequel, but like I said, it bombed. So that is never going to happen. But Harrison Ford actually looks like he was giving a shit while he was in that movie. So that's saying something. He's like, give me the, give me the money. Enemy of the State, uh, this is a Tony Scott flick. I love Tony Scott. His movies are frantic and crazy and like edited like a Michael Bay movie. Uh, but this was like one of the first times Will Smith got like an action role, like headlining. Uh, him and Gene Hackman, old fart. <laughs> uh, but it's like a political thriller, kind of paranoia stuff in it. Uh, it's really good. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I did buy the director's cut of this on DVD, like... Uh, was it Hollywood Video? Was it Hollywood or Touchstone or whatever? Where it was releasing like these director's cuts of like Tony Scott's movies that he made for them and some of the other Bruckheimer movies. Uh, like um, Gone in 60 Seconds got a director's cut. Crimson Tide got a director's cut. This got a director's cut. Director's cut of this was terrible. The director's cut of Crimson Tide it was terrible. The director's cut of Gone in 60 Seconds was pretty good. It actually put the character development back in. But it's a great little movie. It's got a great soundtrack. I think it's Trevor Rabin. Or Harry Gregson Williams. It's a great... Is it both of them? No, it's Trevor Rabin and Harry Gregson Williams. I was half right. But it's a great little movie, and it really made me take notice of Will Smith. I was like, yeah, he's great in ensemble movies, like, you know, Independence Day and all that, but he can actually carry a movie also. Animal of the State. Yeah, get out of my booty. Mm. <laughs> it tickles. Anyway, sorry. I'm a little hyper. <laughs> For once, I'm not tired as hell. I'm actually hyper tonight. Um, Enter the Dragon. So, I had seen this movie when I was a kid on TV somewhere. 
and it didn't impress me like at all. I was not a Bruce Lee fan as a kid. A lot of my friends were. I just couldn't get into it. I was just like, oh, it just it's so hokey and ugh. and like martial arts just was not my thing until I saw Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat was made me go, oh, martial arts, that's awesome because those fights in that first Mortal Kombat movie were fantastic, and because of that, that was my gateway drug into martial arts films. So I started watching all the Jackie Chan movies. I started going back and watching all the Bruce Lee films. I started going back and just watching nothing but Hong Kong cinema. And I went and rewatched Enter the Dragon. I was like, I'm a dumbass. Uh, but it's a great movie that Mortal Kombat actually borrowed the idea of the tournament from. I mean, Mortal Kombat is basically Enter the Dragon with, you know, supernatural stuff um, and magic. So it's a fantastic movie. It's the movie that would have made Bruce Lee like a household name and just like his kid. Uh, Brandon, you know, died right before he broke into the big time, which is really sad. But uh, John Saxon's out of place in here. You know, this guy that obviously can't do martial arts is in there. But Jim Kelly is a fantastic martial artist, and I need to go and track down some of those like black exploitation kung fu movies that he did in the seventies because he's great in here. He's he's a talented martial artist, and he's not a bad actor either. Uh, but Bruce Lee, fantastic. I went and watched all of his filmography, including that shitty Game of Death, which was like. 10 minutes of Bruce Lee stuff, and the rest of it was just someone pretending to be Bruce Lee. I haven't opened this one yet, but I have seen it. Um, I bought all the movies in this series in this, at the same time. What's up, Benny Blanco? Oh, I have all the Ong Back... Well, I have the first two Ong Back movies. I saw the first one in the theater. Uh, those are fantastic. I have not watched all of the third one. Yes. I have Android Assault, the movie, the anime, the manga, the comic book welcome neo genesis um we're talking enter the ninja we're talking about martial arts movies uh this is canon films uh yeah the makers of the break-in movies and all that so uh they were trying to get the i guess uh what was it menahem golan and uh or menachem golem and yoram globus uh were trying to make the ninja movies a thing in the early 80s and this was the entry the first movie in this series they made three of them and this one has Franco Nero, the guy who played Django in the old Django movies, and Shokusugi, uh, Japanese, like, Ninpo. I think he's Ninpo Master. That's, or Ninjitsu. I can't remember. Ninjitsu? Nin Ninpo? Something like that. Um, and this is one of the movies where Shokusugi plays the bad guy. This is not a good movie. I remember I rented it back in the day when I was a little kid, and I thought this was so freaking boring. I couldn't get into it. But the sequels I did. Uh, and I didn't really consider them martial arts movies, even though there's like, you know, there's some fighting in it. I just considered them ninja action movies, you know. They're, that was all about the throwing stars and the swords. So, um, I wanted to buy this so I could have the whole collection. I haven't opened it because I'm afraid to watch it. I, I, I know how, mu how much I disliked it as a kid. But I wanted to have it so I could have the complete series, the trilogy. Uh, you'll see the other two movies later on down the line in a, another stream. Uh, Equilibrium. So... I had seen the trailer for this online. This is one of the first trailers I ever watched online was for this. This came out in 2002, the weekend where I started filming my Star Wars fan film. I actually saw this the night before we filmed in the theater. Uh, it only played at like two theaters in the city or in the Chicagoland area. It only played two places. Me and my friend and I went and, got, went and saw it and we were completely blown away. I mean, this has martial arts in it, which at this point I love. But it added guns into the mix. So all of a sudden there's this gun foo thing going on in this movie. They called it, I think, Gun Kata. Uh, Christian Bale is is not only whooping the shit out of people with his fist, but he's also shooting people at the same time as he's doing these martial arts hand movements and stuff. It's one of the, some of the craziest off-the-wall stuff I've ever seen, but it's actually a pretty fun movie that's kind of like if you were to take 1984, you know, the whole dystopian future thing, and mix it with a martial arts movie. And it's really fun. I loved it a lot. And actually, if you watch the fan films that I did, a couple of shots are actually stolen out of this movie. Uh, the director, Kurt Wimmer, ended up making Ultraviolet after this. And he tried to make the gun kata thing even bigger and, you know, uh, crazier, and it didn't work. Uh, but it's a fantastic flick. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's one of the first movies that really made me take notice of Christian Bale as an actor, because he did that before he did Batman. I was not really impressed by American Psycho. Uh, there's a... I need to... Oh, this is going to be going away. Uh, because uh, Scream Factory, I think, released it. It's just released a special edition of this. I need to actually order it. But Escape from L.A., this is the sequel to Escape from New York, which is right here. I have the Scream Factory version of this. 
Uh, yeah, so Escape from L.A., Escape from New York. Escape from New York is a fantastic, really low-budget action movie. I mean, there isn't really a whole lot of action going on in it, but the characters are so likable, and the uh, the whole environment of like New York as a prison is really interesting and kind of creepy that uh, you just keep watching and you just kind of want to see what kind of weird shit's going to happen next, and I absolutely love it. Uh, I watched this, I don't know how much as a kid. A friend of mine actually, like wrote a comic book sequel to this that was like Return to New York, I think it was called. Uh, and Snake Plissken is probably one of my favorite like westerny action movie characters from the 80s. It's fantastic. The sequel, on the other hand, while not bad... What direction am I facing? This? Okay. The sequel isn't bad. It's just, I think it was ahead of its time. Him and Newsies, I was not. I hate musicals. I had to watch Newsies for... I think it was the old podcast that I did where we were recording commentary tracks for movies with uh, guests. And the guest that we had that day chose Newsies, and I had never seen it all the way through, and I had to, I suffered through that whole movie. Anyway, Escape from L.A., I saw it in the theater, like, opening day. Like, I called out of work with a friend, and we went and saw it opening day. And I liked it, but I didn't like it at the same time because I was like, wow, that was basically just Escape from New York all over again, just with L.A. stuff, you know, subbing in for the New York stuff that they made fun of in that movie. But now I watch it and I laugh my ass off because it's kind of prophetic. The whole plastic surgery nightmare thing. Uh, a lot of the stuff that they're making fun of in L.A., I had never been to L.A. before. So I was not really aware of some of the things they were ragging on until I actually went to L.A. to visit my brother twice, like two years in a row. And then I watched this and I was just kind of like, aha! <laughs> so I do find this a very entertaining movie now. It is cheap at times i mean it was a really expensive movie to make but don't forget cgi in 1996 i think this came out yeah 96 cgi was still kind of new and uh it was hard to find someone who could do it well the cgi in this movie is terrible absolutely awful uh but i do enjoy it a lot now but i'm like i need to set this aside because i'm getting rid of it because that special edition's coming out oh and same with this one this one's getting a special edition finally Woo! Event Horizon. Uh, Paul Anderson, the guy who directed the Mortal Kombat movie. This was his follow-up movie. He did this instead of Mortal Kombat Annihilation. And even though I love this and he says he loves this movie too, he wishes he actually did Mortal Kombat Annihilation to stop it from being a piece of shit. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, yeah, this is The Shining on a Spaceship. It's a sci-fi horror movie. And it was heavily, heavily edited in post-production. It got an X rating when they first turned it into the MPAA. So uh, Paul Anderson had to cut out a lot of violence and a lot of plot and character development. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the movie. It is very short. The movie's like just under 90 minutes before the credit, the end credits start. Um, but visually, it's really cool. I love the gothic feel of the Event Horizon ship. It's, it, it's like a haunted house. And the creepy stuff that does go on in it is it works. But a lot of stuff is just kind of thrown at you without any explanation. And they don't really develop the characters a whole lot. So you kind of don't give a crap. But the stuff that's going on is creepy enough. And like the whole situation is creepy enough that it kind of tides me over. I can I can deal with it. Um, but the Shout... Or sorry, Scream Factory. They just announced that they're going to be doing a complete special edition version of this. I think a week ago. And they are really out there looking for all that deleted footage that Paul Anderson thinks that thinks that was thrown away. Uh, the reason we never got like a director's cut at, when this came out on home video or anything was he thought that the deleted stuff that they cut out had been lost and thrown away, destroyed somehow. But there was some scenes that he had had on a, on a VHS tape. So some of the deleted scenes are on this disc as a secondary thing, like on the uh, bonuses and they are horrible quality because like I said, it's from a VHS tape, but the Shout Screen Factory people are out there looking right now for the original footage so they can actually have Paul Anderson put the movie back together the way he wanted, which I'm really looking forward to if they can actually pull that off. But it's a fun movie. It's a, it's not the greatest thing ever. It's got a weird techno soundtrack with some orchestral stuff mixed in. It's like, well, the first thing I think of Haunted House movie, the last thing I want that goes to, comes to mind is Orbital. You know, the techno band from the 90s. But it works. <laughs> I still listen to it in my car. Okay, so now we have one of my favorite film series, even though I can't stand one of them. Uh, the Evil Dead. Uh, this is the original Evil Dead from 82, I think it was. 1982 or 81. Does not say. Damn you to hell. I get my numbers wrong. 
does not say shit anyway not a big fan of the original evil dead it has a lot of cool like low budget effects in it and yeah bruce campbell is awesome in it as usual he's kind of like the ripley of this movie he's the the wimpy guy in the, the group of friends who go to the cabin and when all the shit hits the fan he's the wimpy guy but he ends up becoming the hero at the end uh and does a whole ripley effect thing that's kind of clever but it's just gore on top of gore on top of gore and there's really no story uh but i understand this is just supposed to be a gore fest and not much more but and i just i can't get into it like i always end up getting bored while i'm watching it i can't stand the acting i can't stand the characters i mean even bruce campbell at the for the first like two-thirds of the movie is just kind of like oh will you just shut up <laughs> Uh, then we have the remake of the original Evil Dead, which I have not opened yet, but I did see this in the theater. I saw an advanced screening of this a month before it came out. My girlfriend at the time and I, uh, I signed up for this contest on Ain't It Cool News, and I won two tickets to go see the sneak preview of this. And we were both, like, really, really impressed. Um, it is not a... Sh I mean, the setup for the movie is the same of the original. You know, a bunch of friends go to a cabin and demons and you know infest them and stuff like that. Only thing is, in that one, in the original, the people went to that uh, cabin to party and get drunk and have sex. Here, it's to have an intervention for a friend who is like a junkie, which I thought was really clever. I thought that was a really cool idea to set it apart, you know? And there's also the whole idea of when the shit starts to go down, is the character who is going through the withdrawals that, you know, they're having the intervention for, is she actually like hallucinating this stuff? Or is it really happening? And that was another really cool twist. And then when the gore starts to kick in, it's like, holy crap, damn. And then the big twist happens at the end, which I did not see coming. And I, I was like, okay, this is awesome. They they redid it. They didn't make it a carbon copy. I absolutely love this. I just have not had the urge to watch it again because it is kind of hard to watch. This movie is gory as hell. I mean, it is disgusting at times. So I kind of like need to be in the mood to watch something like this. I love me a good horror movie, but when a movie is just kind of like gross to be gross at times, I have to kind of have to be in the right mood. I just answered your question, Benny. <laughs> and then we have Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. Uh, yeah, this one is my favorite in the series. It is half horror and half comedy, and it's all awesome. Uh, Bruce Campbell comes back. They couldn't get, or Sam Raimi couldn't get the rights to any of the footage from the first movie to do a recap for people who hadn't seen the original. So he ended up shooting like this five minute sort of like condensed version of everything that happens in the movie, but he cuts out three of the characters. It's just Bruce Campbell and his girlfriend. And he basically recaps the entire first movie in five minutes. And then once the camera runs into Bruce Campbell's chest, that's where the actual sequel begins because that's where the first movie ended. The camera ran into Bruce Campbell's chest while he was standing outside of the cabin. And that's where part two picks up. And it is one of the craziest movies so, like I said, I've said before, I was not allowed to watch horror movies when I was a kid. My parents thought that they would, it would that horror movies would scar my brother and I for life. So, he rented this, and it was, at that point in time, I still wasn't allowed to watch them. So he rented it, and while my mother was, I think she went bowling that night with some friends or out dancing with some friends. My dad watched it in the basement, away from my brother and I. And when it was over, he came upstairs and he just had this smile on his face. He goes to the to me and my brother. He goes come downstairs, you need to watch this. So we watched it again with the two of us, and we were, like, laughing the whole time. And then my mother came home, once the movie ended, the, my mother came home, my, brother, my dad goes, come down here, you gotta watch this. My dad watched it three times in one night. That's how much he liked it. He showed my brother and I, and then he showed my mother, and then whenever fa family friends or, or members of the family from out of town would come, my dad would immediately say, we're gonna watch this movie tonight after dinner, you're gonna love it. And, yeah, it's a fantastically funny, goofy, uh, horror comedy. I just got this one not too long ago. Um, Executive Decision, uh, Kurt Russell movie. The one where Steven Seagal is in it for 15 minutes and then gets sucked out an airlock. <laughs> uh, Halle Berry is one of the first movies I think I saw her in. This is a, a, an action thriller about an a airplane that gets hijacked by terrorists. And a bunch of like commandos are assigned to go and like clear them out they, they get in like a stealth plane and they kind of attach themselves to the bottom of the ship and try to sneak into the plane and i can't remember exactly why kurt russell's there i haven't seen this in probably 20 years uh but he ends up taking over once uh steven seagal gets character his character gets killed and uh, i remember being pretty awesome like i wasn't expecting it to be as tense as it was but i need to watch this again i'll probably watch this over uh fourth of july weekend here's a 4k i got Ex Machina. Got this at half price books for 10 bucks. 
Um, I wanted to see this in the theater, never got around to it. Ended up watching it, uh, streaming at my brother's house when I was visiting him in L.A. Uh, he went and he had something to do, and he was going to drive me and my mother around the city for something, but he had stuff to do in the morning, so I watched it while I was waiting. And it's pretty fantastic. The first time I've ever seen Alicia Vikander in a movie, but this also has Dom Hall Gleason and Oscar Isaac from the new Star Wars trilogy. And it also, and it's all about Oscar Isaac has made like an artificial person, and he brings... Dom Hall Gleason in to test it to see if it actually has like human responses if it can pass as human and then bad shit starts to happen and it's pretty awesome the special effects for the cyborg girl is fantastic like you can I cannot tell that it's CGI it looks like she has like this dome for a head and that she's got these robot arms it's CGI but it's fantastic it's a great little existentially science fiction movie that I think is kind of kind of awesome okay so here's one that a lot of people don't like um it got lambasted when it first came out it got cut to shit by uh the production studio so did the movie that came after this too uh yeah this had like a big troubled history and i always wanted to see it but like i said wasn't really allowed to watch horror movies but it just came and went so fast i never got a chance to anyway if i if i would have wanted to it came and went so quick but i saw it when it came out on home video and that's exorcist 3 i'm not a fan of the first exorcist i just think it boils down to a little girl cursing I don't find it scary. I really don't. Uh, the second movie's a joke. I will never own that in my life. But the third one is the one that gets me. The third one is the one that creeps me out because it has this really creepy atmosphere. And it's all about um, this Gemini killer who uh, the detective that George C. Scott plays thought he had, he thought he had killed the Gemini killer like 15 years before the movie takes place. But someone is copycatting that killer and they can't figure out how it's happening or who's doing it. And it turns out because that Gemini killer has possessed the priest from the first movie, the one who like uh, was a Father Karras who jumped down the uh, jumped out the window after Pazuzu possessed him and he fell down the stairs. As he was dying, the Gemini killer was being executed and he his spirit slipped in and it took 15 years to unscramble the priest's brain to get to the point where he could actually talk again. And he's been possessing old people in this uh, na- the he, the institution that he's in. There's like a convalescent home attached to it and he's been possessing the old people to go out and do the killings and it has one of the greatest like shock moments in film history like i jumped when i first saw it i still kind of do i just the anticipation of it happening i'm like it's gonna happen it's gonna happen it's gonna happen i'm like i think i know the exact second it's gonna happen and then nope shit there it is (laughs) it's great it's well acted it's creepy as hell it's got this really creepy vibe and it's it's gory but not like super gory I think it's just a real atmos- real cool atmosphere core movie. And the cool thing about this set is it has the original cut before Morgan Creek took the movie away from the director and had stuff reshot. So the whole there like the movie was called Exorcist 3. Originally there was no exorcism in it. So when they saw the cut that the director made, they were like, "Where's the exorcism? You got exorcist in the title. Where's the exorcism?" And he's like, "It doesn't need one because it's based on a book." And the book didn't have an exorcism in it. So they went and got rid of the director and brought someone else in and they shot an exorcism that's part of the end of the movie now. But the exorcism part is really creepy and gross, so it's like, it's worth watching. It's a fantastic movie, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's a really good, creepy little movie. The director's cut, I can see why they wanted it reshot because it's just really slow and the finale is like super anticlimactic. So I can understand why they were like, yeah, we need to go back and fix this. Anyway, Fargo, Um, I saw this in the theater, not really knowing anything about it, I was just trying to go out at this time, this came out in like 96, I think, either 95 or 96, at that point in time, I was just trying to go out and see a bunch of different types of movies, I was always just watching like action movies and science fiction and horror, I was like, I want to see something else, and I did not expect this to be a comedy, it's like a police procedural comedy, (laughs) and I'd never really seen a Coen Brothers movie, I think the only one that I had seen at this point was Raising Arizona. And I couldn't stand it when I was a kid. When I, It used to be on cable all the time, and I could not stand it. Now I watch it, and I crack up. But I just didn't get the humor, and I didn't get what was going on. But now I watched Fargo that one time in the theater, and I was like, okay, I need to go back and watch the other movies that these guys have made. And I saw every pretty much every movie that they made from this point on in the theater. And uh, Fargo's a fantastic movie. It's even got that TV show that I need to watch. I know Ewan McGregor's in one of the seasons. But it's a great little like crime comedy. How many of these do I have? Two? Well, I got a couple others, but they're all worded differently. Um, I'm a big fan of the Fast and Furious movies. Don't judge me. 
<laughs> um, I had all of them at once on Blu-ray, but then I went to a Half Price Books one time, and they had the 4K versions of the movies, or a couple of them, for like five bucks each. They were trying to just get rid of them, so I was like, okay, I'll upgrade. So I picked up a copy of Fast and the Furious. This is the original one. I like how they have to put the original on there because like the titles for these movies go all over the place, and it's hard to keep track of what's what. Uh, but the original one I saw in the theater, like, opening night, and I, I liked it. It was decent. I wasn't really familiar with any of the actors in here except for Vin Diesel, who I'd seen in Pitch Black. But didn't know Michelle Rodriguez. I didn't know Paul Walker. I didn't know Jordana Brewster. Or did I? No, I knew Jordana Brewster from The Faculty. That's the only other person I knew. Uh, but it is more about the racing than anything else. The movie's moved away from that down the line. But it's a fun little crime action movie. You know, it introduced you to all the characters that have become super popular, you know, in future films. And then we have the last one that got made, which is The Fate of the Furious. I like the eight, eight, cleverness. Not really. Um, yeah, this is the last one they made. Um, part nine was supposed to come out in April, I do believe. And then coronavirus kicked everyone in the junk. And now it's coming out in 2021. I think April 2021. Uh, but they filmed 9 and 10 at the same time, so I don't know if they're going to release the 10th one a year later, or if they're going to try to release them both within the same year. It's going to be weird. Uh, but this one's, it's fun. It's They kind of piss a lot of people off by making Jason Statham character, who was the villain in the 7th movie, the hero, like a hero in this one. And they're like, he killed one of the characters that we all loved from the other movies, and you're going to all of a sudden, like, everyone's like, forgiven? Or forgiven him at this point? No. Uh, I think that's what they're trying to fix in the ninth movie. Uh, but it's a fun movie. It just goes way over the top at the end with like them out running a freaking submarine on the ice. It's nuts. <laughs> uh, Jet Li's Fearless, the uh, director's cut. It's a pretty awesome martial arts movie. I think this is also like a retelling of that Ip Man uh, story. Um, it's decent. I saw it in the theater. Loved it in the theater. Didn't realize how much of it was cut out. I think there's like a good 20 minutes that were added back into it. So it's a long movie now. But... It's fantastic. The fight scenes are great, and it actually is more of like a drama about the character than the fight scenes, which is something I wasn't expecting, but the guy who directed Bride of Chucky did this. <laughs> Have you ever karate chopped the jet? Not really. <laughs> Welcome, Solo. How are you doing tonight? Uh, here's a funny one. Uh, Feast. This is the unrated cut. So, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a show on HBO called Project Greenlight that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck were producing. Where it was like a reality show where a bunch of filmmakers would try to pitch these ideas for movies. Uh, they they'd never gotten the choice. They never had the chance to make a movie before. And this was like a, a reality show to give them the chance to make a feature film. And then Ben Affleck and Miramax and uh, Matt Damon would produce that movie make sure it got made. And they'd help out with the casting and the special effects and all the money required to make it. And also I think it was also, it had to do with the directors and it also had to do with the screenwriters. And the guy that won the directing was uh, John Gulliger, whose uh, father, Clue Gulliger, was in like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and The Hidden and a bunch of other movies since like the 60s, I want to say. And the screenplay that won was Feast. And it's like this really goofy horror movie uh, where a bunch of people are trapped in a bar when these like uh, mutant creatures are out there uh, trying to get in to eat everybody, to kill everybody. And uh, there's like these baby versions that want to hump everything. And one of them humps like a dead guy's mouth at one point. It's just... It's weird, it's goofy, I think it's funny as hell, like, like when you see the characters that are the heroes, that are one people that are going to get locked in the bar before the, uh, the uh, monster attack happens, it does like a whole thing, like when they first introduce them, like the, there's like a freeze frame and it tells you the person's name and their life expectancy within the movie. And Jason Mewes is one of the characters in here. And it actually, he's playing himself, and when they show him like playing pool, and then when he see, like stands up after shooting... It stands up and it says, Jason Muse. He's already exceeded all of our expectations. I was like, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> but it's a really clever, funny horror movie. Uh, don't watch the sequels. They uh, ruined them in the sequels. They are god-awful, unfunny, just like sex, rape jokes, and just gross, and no. All the no. This is one of my favorite foreign movies. Uh, La Femme Nikita, or The, the Woman Nikita. But I, I know a lot of people actually will, like, put this in the L's because of La. I'm like, La is the in French. I put it under Femme. So, um, it's an awesome movie by Luc Besson, the guy who ended up doing um, Fifth Element and Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Uh, and it's a thriller, action thriller, about a junkie who kills a cop during a, a robbery. 
and she gets executed, sort of. Uh, it was a front. She actually gets recruited by like a secret government agency that's making assassins, and she gets trained to be an assassin, and it's all about her trying to like actually go out on her own, try to actually live a life, and have to juggle assassinating people at the same time. It's actually a really well done movie, and like I wanted to see every single Luc Besson movie after this, and I did. I've seen pretty much every one of his movies in the theater. Absolutely loved it. Um, I watch this at least once a year. That and like uh, The Professional, Leon the Professional, or two movies I always watch, end up watching them back to back because they kind of deal with the same things. Here's a classic Chicago movie. You got Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This is the Bueller, Bueller edition. I don't know what's so extra about it. It just has like a making of, I think. I don't really think it has any... Well, it does have a couple of interviews with the actors and stuff. They have one about Ben Stein because he plays a teacher in here. Um, I saw this in the drive-in as a kid. Absolutely love it. It's like really funny, especially if you're a Chicago person. The stuff they make fun of in Chicago in this movie, it's awesome. And even back then I knew what was going on. Because uh, I saw this in the driving when it first came out. And this came out in 86. So I was either 11 or 12. Oh look, it even opens up and shows all the locations in Chicago where he was. What are you talking about? Peter, what are you doing? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's an awesome uh, comedy. Um, I, recently, I recently tried to get all of the early john hughes movie so i just recently picked up 16 candles um i recently picked up breakfast club got this i still need to get pretty in pink um and vacation national lampoon's vacation uh but this is probably my favorite of the bunch because it's just the most generally funny movie out of all of them i mean it's, it's just a straight up comedy there's really no storyline well if you want to talk about the camera and stuff the camera stuff about him dealing with his dad is basically the the character arc thing but there's really nothing going on with ferris there's really nothing going on with his girlfriend it's just basically about them going around all day. Like, they ditch school, and let's go and have fun in Chicago. Uh, I, I could watch that any day of the week. And it, whenever it was on cable, I would just stop what I was doing and finish it. I didn't care where it was in the movie. I would just finish it. So we're just speaking about Luke Besson with La Femme Nikita. Fifth Element, this is the movie he's probably the most well-known for. I saw this four times in the theater. And the first time I saw this, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I'm I think I'm almost at like a thousand Blu-rays. What's up, Jason? How's it going, man? Yeah, I'm thinking I'm I'm just shy of a thousand Blu-rays right now. Blu-rays UK or UH Wow, UHD. Oh, what am I talking about? 4K UH Oh god, I can't even talk right now. 3D Blu-rays and all that, yeah. It's about a thousand. Um, yeah, I saw this in the theater. Well, the trailer misled me. The trailer made me think it was going to be this, like, super serious science science fiction movie that was like Dune or something. I was just like, wow, that looks freaking amazing. Like, just the visuals of it, and, like, there's no there was no talking in the trailer. It was just music and shots from the film, and I was like, that's going to be amazing. We never saw Chris Tucker in the trailer <laughs> with his penis hair. Um, so I went in... I went like opening day. I called out of work. A friend and I went and saw it, and both of us were like, "What the hell was that?" I didn't expect it to be like a science fiction comedy, so I was like, "That's not what I wanted. I wanted a comedy." The HD DVDs in the trash. I actually, I actually had an HD DVD player. I had the one for the 360, and I sold that shit. Sold it all to GameStop the day before. They said to the people in the stores, "Don't accept those for trade-ins anymore." Because I went there and I sold all of it, the the system, and all the HD DVDs I had. And then I went in there like three days later to actually use the credit that I got. And the guy was like, dude, you're lucky you came in when you did Because if you came in the next day, we would have been like, nope, can't take it. Multi-pass. Yeah. So, the only problem was, even though I couldn't stand it, was I had already promised another group of friends that I would go see this with them the next day. And I was like, I want to hang out with my friends. They already got the ticket. I'll go. I'm like, whatever. But when I watched it that second time, I was like, I got it. I was like, okay, I see what's going on. My expectations are in check. I know what's going to happen. I was like, I was actually enjoying it. And I enjoyed it so much that second time that I ended up seeing it like two other times with other people. And it's a fantastic, visually in insane movie. Uh, Coruscant from the Star Wars prequels was stolen from this movie. What New York looks like in this movie is basically Coruscant. George Lucas stole it. 
Um, yeah, it's a fantastic movie. Mila Jovovich's boobs, her butt, all over the place in here. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. How this got a PG-13 rating, I don't know. There was so much nudity in this movie. Um, but it's just, the music is fantastic. The visuals are fantastic. The costumes, everything about it. Even Bruce Willis looks like he's just enjoying himself, which is why another reason why I think I like it as much as I do, because Bruce Willis just looked like he's having, like, the time of his life. And it's like, you don't see that in him anymore. He always just looks like he's like, uh. So to see him, like, like enjoying himself is just fantastic. That whole scene with the diva singing on stage is probably one of my favorite scenes in, like, a science fiction movie. Someone give me one in, like, 20 movies I still have somewhere. <laughs> uh, Fight Club. Uh, this is the 10th anniversary edition. has a bunch of extras on it. And uh, I was not prepared for this movie. I'm a huge David Fincher fan ever since I saw Alien 3. Um, I, I've seen every single movie that he's made in the theater and I was not prepared for this. The trailers, I'd never read the book. The trailers did not prepare me for it. So when I saw it in the theater, it just kind of blew my mind and I just ended up going home and rarely do I have the urge to like write something about something I've just seen. And I actually like, I got home, didn't say anything to anybody, picked up a legal pad and I just started writing my thoughts on the movie out on like, you know, by hand. And I ended up writing like 10 pages worth of stuff. It just, it completely blew my mind. It's a fantastic, nihilistic movie. It's really angry. <laughs> it's, but it's clever. And the twist that happens, it, it, you, it's like watching The Sixth Sense. Oh, the clues have been there the whole time. You just don't know what you're looking for. So the first time you watch it, it kind of like, poof. it's great. I absolutely love it. It's fantastic. Oh, God. How many movies are in this franchise? Okay. So... Why do I have these all out of order? I don't know. We've got the Final Destination movies. All of them. The good ones, the bad ones, all of them. So, we got the first one, which I do like. Um, it's a clever premise about a bunch of people dodging death. They're supposed to die in an airplane, but one of the, char one of the characters, uh, Devin Sawa's character... Has like a premonition of it have the explosion on the plane happening and he convinces everyone to get off the plane before it happens. And like death is like, bitches, you were supposed to die there. I'm gonna get you. <laughs> and it's all about the people that survived getting killed in these weird Rube Goldberg style ways. It's really crazy. And it's fun. Uh, I wish they left the original ending in there. But uh, it's really cool. And it set up a franchise which I did not see coming. Uh, but then we have part two, which is one of my favorite movies in the franchise. Uh, Allie Larder, she can just do whatever she wants to me anytime. That's all I gotta say. Uh, but this one, the gore was upped a little bit. This one is more about, like, misdirection when it comes to the kills. Like, each movie seems to try to do something else with the kills. Like I said, it was Rube Goldberg type things in the first one. In this one, it's like misdirection. They make you think that this thing over here is gonna do it. And then this thing that was over here that you weren't really paying attention to is what actually does it. And, yeah, it's kind of gross, kind of nasty. But it's fun. It has a really stupid ending. <laughs> but I like this one. This is one of my favorite ones. I like. I watched that one probably the most other than another one in here. Uh, then we got Final Destination 3, which I can't stand. Never kiss a girl. Hmm. Um, anyway, can't stand this one. I saw it on the IMAX when it was first released, and I was just like, no. It's like you could tell they had kind of run out of ideas. The kills are stupid. The characters are really unlikable and kind of just dumb. So I was not into it, and I was kind of like, well, I hope they end it there because I can't see them continuing this if that's the uh, angle they're going for. They're just going to make characters unlikable. And Then we got The Final Destination, which was supposedly the last one. Uh, and this was the first one that was in 3D. And I went and saw this in 3D in the theater, and I was another one where I was just kind of like, what's the point? At this point, it's just, let's just poke you in the eye with blood and guts and stuff like that, and the characters are not likable at all. So yeah, let's just watch... Like, horribly nasty things happen to people. And I was like, eh. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, I think I'm getting uh, a uh, corpse flood. I'm going to use some of that awesome uh, moderator skills. Actually, you know what? Hey, Peter. Let me, let me do something. There you go. Hey, Peter, do me a favor. <laughs> do something you just been promoted anyway um final destination 5 is in 3d this is the final film in the franchise now they're trying to reboot it 
This one is the one where I was like, okay, they finally did something cool with it. You know, they had kind of been tired for the last two movies, and I was really not looking forward to this one. But I've been reading, like, reviews from advanced screenings, and people are saying, like, this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the best one since part two. And I had to agree. I saw it by myself in 3D one night when I was, like, I was I was coming home from my parents' house. I was visiting my parents. I was on my way back to the city. And I was just kind of like, I, I just don't want to go home yet. I'm, I'm going to go see a movie. So I went and saw this, and I was like, yes. Um, so I liked it so much that I went and saw a midnight showing of it with my girlfriend at the time. And she was like, yes, I, she hadn't liked any of these movies since part two either. And, uh, I, it blew her mind. And I was like, the, the thing about this is the big twist. The thing that I thought was really clever was you don't realize as you're watching the movie that this movie takes place before the first movie. There's clues all over the place. I, you just don't notice them. I didn't. There's like a ticket you see in a drawer that tells you that it, the, the movie's taking place in the year 2000, but I just wasn't looking at that. It's like misdirection. They're making you look at one thing, but if you really explore the frame, you will see uh, that the uh, there's these airline tickets in this guy's drawer that says that they're for so-and-so a date in the year 2000. I didn't notice until the second time I saw it with my, my ex. So there's also, like, I didn't realize that everyone's using these old-ass freaking flip phones in the movie. I just didn't wasn't paying attention to that. And it's like there's clues all over the place that this movie takes place before the first movie. And then it comes full circle in the ending. And I was like, yep, that's how you end a franchise. And I was like, it ends here. It needed to end here. I hope it doesn't go any further. Now they're just talking about rebooting it. And the 3D in this one is absolutely fantastic. Some of the nastiest shit goes down to this movie in 3D. And it's great. And they also introduced the whole idea that since they've, and it's ever since the first movie, the order of the, the order that people died in the accident that was supposed to kill them before they dodged the death. Um, you can skip a place if you kill the, if you kill the person who was going to die after you, I think it was. If you kill somebody that was going to die in that accident, you skip, a, it skips you or the death, the death will ignore you. And then they kind of blow that out of the water at the end. Oh, that's that's Final Destination Two Solo. Uh, that's the one with the accident with the uh, on the highway. The third one is the roller coaster, and I thought that was just terrible. <laughs> that was just terrible. The the first one is the airplane. The second one is the highway. The third one is the roller coaster. The fourth one is the NASCAR race, and the fifth one is the bridge collapsing. I will give each movie, aside from the third one, props. The opening accident scene is usually pretty awesome. It's a lot of really cool stunts and a lot of really cool kills. The third one is the only one where I was like, this just looks like crap. Yeah, they're making another one. They're rebooting it. Not really looking forward to it. I was like, just end it at five and leave it there. Make a new franchise of something. Be creative. Don't just keep rebooting it. Uh, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. Um, not the Final Fantasy movie people were really looking for, but since I was not a huge Final Fantasy fan, I never really got into Final Fantasy VII as much as other people did. I really had no expectations for it. I knew the themes of the games. The whole Gaia thing was usually something, and there was a character named Sid in it. This had all that in it. So, you know what? For me, it worked. I saw this opening night on the IMAX with a big group of friends, and every single one of us was like, that was awesome. Like, we, like none of us knew what we were going to get. So all of us were blown away. And I saw this in the theater, I want to say, three times. People who were big fans of the games are the ones that were complaining about it. And yes, I do agree. I wish this wasn't called Final Fantasy. Excuse me, The Se the Spirits Within. I just wanted it to be called The Spirits Within. If it, The Final Fantasy just made people expect something it wasn't going to be. Uh, but the, uh, the animation is fantastic. I love the score by Elliot Goldenthal. It looks amazing. The storyline is pretty cool. The storyline is something you have to like see the movie twice to really grasp. They kind of like gloss over a major element of what's really going on they it's like a it's like a throwaway line almost to tell you what's happening and it's worded weird because the movie was written in japanese and then translated to english and like the wording is strange but it's fantastic yes there's times where people's faces don't work right <laughs> like the only people whose faces they seem to come to like really focus on was the main character um that's a uh, aki ross the guy that um, Alec Baldwin is playing and Dr. Sid. Those are the only characters who, like, their facial expressions are great. Everyone else is kind of like, we'll deal with them later. And they never did the final render on their faces. So, uh, I really love it. I watch this at least once a year. It's one of my favorite video game movies. Here's a cheeseball one. Flash Gordon. 
This came out in 1980. I saw this in the movie theater. <laughs> I was like, I think four or five. Um, I absolutely love this movie. It's one of my favorites. Um, sure, it's cheesy as hell. The acting ain't all that great. But this movie's all about the special effects. Like the, like the model work is fantastic. The art design, the costumes, the music by Queen. Goddamn. Um, I could just watch this movie and turn the volume off until a Queen song comes on. Then I usually turn the volume back up. Uh, but like turn the volume off and just look at the frame and just see what's going on in the, in the, in the shot. There is so much detail in everything. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. I love it. Hey, moderators, let's get going. Anyway. Where is it? There we go. Uh, Flatliners. This Joel Schumacher just passed away this week at like 80. This was one of my favorite movies of his, Flatliners. It has Kiefer Sutherland, Julie Roberts, and uh, Kevin Bacon. also has um, Oliver Platt in one of the first movies I ever saw. Really, guys? Really? People, don't be dicks. Um, anyway, a bunch of uh, grads, medical grad students want to experiment with death. They want to see how long they can stay dead and still be revived. Uh, it was not okayed by their teachers, so they do it in secret. And when each person dies, you, they kind of bring something back with them. They have like an like a out-of-body experience when they're dead, and they bring something from their past back with them that's like haunting them. And they kind of have to make peace with it. It's it's they make it the trailers made it look like a horror movie. Yeah, it is. Uh, they make it look like a horror movie in the trailers. It's really just kind of like a drama thriller. Uh, but visually, it's pretty awesome. I love that blanket that they use to like cool people down and heat people up. It's basically like um, a bubble wrap with like a, a neon light going through it that turns blue when it's cold and red when it's hot. It's like stupid as all hell, but I'm like okay, <laughs> but. It's a it's a, a really different movie. It's really different than what I expected. That's why I liked it as much as I did. I think it's kind of fantastic. Um, this is one of those movies that Disney was trying to forget. Uh, Flight of the Navigator. What is going on here? Yeah, my alpha my collection is in alphabetical order. Jesus, people are being schmucks tonight. I get my own, uh, my own uh, remember Kenna thing going on tonight. Anyway, uh, Flight of the Navigator is like a, it was a Disney movie. I saw it in the theater. Uh, it kind of disappeared after that. It came out on home video, and then Disney never really did anything with it after that. It never showed on like the Wild or the Wonderful World of Disney or anything like that. It never showed on like the Disney Channel or anything. It is actually on Disney Plus, which surprised the hell out of me. But uh, basically, it's about a kid who. Uh, people, his family thinks he gets kidnapped. What really happened was he got kidnapped or he got, uh, abducted by an alien and all this information about the, was it the home planet that the ship came from is downloaded in the kid's head. But because the kid was traveling at the speed of light time for him stopped, but time on everywhere else kept on going. So like he comes back seven years later, looking the exact same age he was when he disappeared, but everything in his family and everything in the world has moved on seven years. And uh, the ship that he's on, cr that he was on, crashes and gets uh, found by I think NASA or whatever. And he needs to get the data out of his head and back into the computer on the ship so the ship can go home. And it's kind of like trying to be like ET and a little bit of Close Encounters, and but it's also kind of trying to be Goonies esque. It's it's really strange. Uh, Pee Wee Herman is the voice of the robot in the ship, and it's really strange. <laughs> he like goes by the name Paul Mall in the. Uh, credits so you didn't know it was paul rubens but i always had a soft spot for this one and i actually picked this one up and this is one of those movies that disney or this is actually a, a region free one then i thought this was one of those things like the black hole anyway um yeah uh this never got released on dvd or blu-ray in the u.s which is kind of strange i had to get this off of amazon and i got it from some country other than the u.s it's a universal release this is like a, a region free release from who knows where weird uh but yeah i bought this because we were gonna watch this for my podcast um sh the movie is starting we made a commentary track with musty hobbit watching this movie and that was the reason i picked it up and as we were watching and i was like 
having little flashbacks to when I was a kid watching. I was like, this movie's actually still pretty fun. It holds up. Here's another awesome Shout Factory movie, and that is Firestarter. Um, I hadn't watched this in probably 20 years when I bought this. Uh, but it was one of the first movies I saw Drew Barrymore in after E.T. Uh, Stephen King new movie where a girl has psychic powers. She can set things on fire with her mind. Not much to it. But it is fun. It has a weird soundtrack by Tangerine Dream. Um, and it is kind of graphic. The different ways people can die by fire. Yes, it's crazy. How on earth does a movie like Final Fantasy get reprinted to Blu-ray? What do you mean reprinted? Is it not available anymore? Uh, Stallone, or sorry, First Blood. Stallone, First Blood. <laughs> uh, First Blood, the original Rambo movie. Uh, this one's my favorite out of them all. Um, this one is actually, it's an action movie, but it's more of like a drama thriller. It's more about PTSD than anything else. Uh, Stallone's character Rambo comes back from Vietnam and all of the people in his platoon like went their separate ways and like he's honestly i think he's like homeless at the beginning of the movie and he's just looking for the people that were in his platoon but they're all like dying off or killing themselves because of all the shit that happened in the war and uh the local police in one of the towns he's in think he's like a transient homeless you know bum or whatever and they're like we don't like people like you in our town and they start mistreating him for absolutely no reason whatsoever and it triggers his ptsd and he starts having flashbacks and thinking that the cops are the Viet Cong, and like goes on this like war against the police and it's like really sad to watch and uh but it's really really good i just i'm kind of i wish they'd use the original ending where uh rambo kills himself at the very end because he just he's like i can't live like this anymore you know people treat me like shit uh everyone thinks that i'm like a murderer because i was you know in the war and all that and he's just he like tells troutman at the very end i can't i can't do this anymore i can't live like this and boom he shoots himself but they didn't want to shoot that. They did shoot it. They didn't use it. They reshot the ending where he lives, and we got all those weird action movie sequels. Uh, but this one is fantastic. It's my favorite one. And from what I understand, Stallone hated the original cut, which was like two and a half hours, and he demanded himself be taken out of the movie. So they recut the movie, and because of the way they re-edited the movie, it changed the way action movies were edited from that way, from that point on, just kind of like the same way Die Hard did. Um... And Stallone was like, okay, now you turn something that I thought was garbage into something fantastic. And, I mean, it, the movie, it, it's awesome. I love it. So, this is another one I bought sight unseen. But I found this at Half Price Books for $3 brand new. And it was in 3D. And it stars Jet Li. So I said, give it to me. And it's called Flying Swords. The Flying Swords of Dragon... Dragon Gate? Whatever. It's a 3D Hong Kong action movie. And I said, yes. I just haven't gotten around to watching it. So I can't really comment on it. Here's another awesome Scream release of one of my favorite horror movies, and that's The Fog. John Carpenter did this right after Halloween, and it stars a lot of the same people, like Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, Charles Cyphers. Uh, but it also has Jamie Lee Curtis's mom in it, Janet Lee, and Hal Holbrook, and Tom Atkins, who is a freaking god amongst actors, and Adrian freaking Barbo. It's basically a ghost story about a bunch of pirates who were killed back in the day over some gold, come back as a supernatural fog and start killing people in the town to get their gold back. It's a simple horror movie, but it's really effective and, and atmospheric, and the music that John Carpenter did for it is awesome. I watch this one at least once a year. I think it's just a fantastically moody horror movie, and the thing is, back in the day, I never wanted to watch this. Even when I got into watching horror movies, I always avoided it because I thought the art on the VHS cover was horrible. And I was like, that looks terrible. I don't care if it's a John Carpenter movie. I'm not watching that. Finally, after I'd like watched all the movies that John Carpenter made at this one particular video store, the only one that was left that I hadn't seen was The Fog. And I was like, hell with it. I'll rent it. And it ended up becoming like one of my favorite John Carpenter movies. And it still is. I think it's just a well-made horror movie that was really misunderstood at the time. But it's fantastic. Uh, this one is still seal, but I've seen this movie more times than I can count. I actually saw this in the theater two years ago at the Music Box. Uh, Forbidden Planet. It's a sci-fi movie from, I think, the 50s. I want to say the 50s. 1958. God damn. Starring a very young Leslie Nielsen before he was known as Frank Drebin. Uh, but it's a really cool... Sci it's, it's more science fiction than anything. Um, uh, 
what was it an expedition crashed on a planet and there's like a rescue ship that Leslie Nielsen's in charge of. They go to find the survivors. All they find are two people left and one robot. And like the people that the guy that survived, this doctor, I think it was Morbius, he actually built himself a house. He has a daughter. He built this robot to protect her. And he found like this alien civilization that used to live on the planet. And he's using like their energy source to like power the house. But there's also like this monster that starts killing the people who are from the rescue uh, team. And it's really awesome the way it plays out. I mean, it is fantastic. I mean, I cannot imagine the amount of money that they spent on this back in the day. If this were to be made nowadays, this movie would cost $300 million. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> but it's really creative and well shot and well animated. There's like this scene where the monster tries to attack the uh, the rescue people's ship, the rescue team's ship. But they put up like this electric uh, electrical gate. And it's like electric beams going between these like posts. And anything that would pass through it, you would see it get electrocuted. Well, it's so big, you see this like animated monster like actually like absorbing the energy from the gate. And it's like this crazy like 10 foot tall monster that's just screaming and roaring walt disney animated that uncredited which is kind of awesome um, i absolutely love this movie it's one of my favorite like old school science fiction movies next to like the day the earth stood still uh forgetting sarah marshall this is the unrated cut this was based on an idea i think by judd apatow and was directed by what's his name nicholas schiller oh god i thought it was the guy that did uh Uh, role models anyway uh, i saw this in the theater with i was the only guy in a group of women <laughs> that went to see this all the women wanted to see it because they'd all recently at least most of them i think had either were in a bad relationship or had just broken up and they wanted to watch something about a breakup and i was like the only person who was like really single in the group and i was just like the whole time going like this is uncomfortable <laughs> Uh, but it's a really funny movie. I absolutely love Kristen Bell, so I wanted to see it for that fact alone. But I also think Jason Segel is a superior, a supremely... God, I can't talk. I need drinks. He is a supremely funny comedian, like a comedic actor. So I wanted to see like his big you know, theatrical debut type thing. And Kristen Bell's sexy as hell. Uh, and it's really, really funny. The unrated cut has maybe five minutes of extra footage, and it's usually just Jonah Hill fawning over... Uh, what's that dude's name? Uh, Russell Brand. <laughs> but there's a lot of really funny cameos in it. Paul Rudd's in it. Like Jonah Hill. A bunch of people from the other uh, Judd Apatow movies of the time. I don't think that... Uh, what's his name? Seth Rogen is in it. I can't... I don't think he is. Anyway. James Bond time! Uh, for your eyes only. This is the one that came out after Moonraker. Okay, so Moonraker was made in a, as response to Star Wars being like this huge monster hit. So um, they decided to make James Bond Goes Into Space. And that ended up being the highest grossing Bond movie ever at that point in time because of that fact. But at the same time, that movie is so over the top and ridiculous. Don't get me wrong. I love Moonraker. It's one of my favorite Bond movies. Um, it was like so over the top and ridiculous that people that made the movie were like, okay, once this is done... Where do we go from here? We can't top this. We're going to go bankrupt. <laughs> so they were like, how about we actually go in the opposite direction? Instead of making it more ridiculous, how about we try to like make it more realistic? Let's take Bond back to a darker place. Let's uh, not really have a whole lot of special effects. Let's just have it be a, a an old school Bond spy adventure. And that's for your eyes only. Um, for some reason, they kill Blofeld at the beginning. I think it's like an F.U., to uh, the guy who was suing them because he said he came up with Spectre, the idea of Spectre and Blofeld, and uh, he wouldn't let them use, he wouldn't let the Bond producers use the characters anymore until the, the I think he got like, a huge royalty. And they're like, you know what? We don't need Blofeld to make these James Bond movies work. So the first thing they do in the movies, they kill him. <laughs> they drop him down a smokestack. But yeah, this one is uh, Bond in Greece, and he's looking for this, uh, looks like a keyboard, like an adding machine that can control nuclear, was it nuclear missiles? Uh, before a black arms dealer gets it and sells it on the black market um it's really really awesome this is one of my favorite bond movies because as much as i love moonraker because of how crazy it is this like i said is the exact opposite this is the the realistic bond movie bond actually like has like a vengeance kill in this normally he's not like that but he sees this one guy and he's like you killed my friend and he kicks him over a cliff and he's like f you 
But yeah, you missed some shit. I had my own little uh, remember Kenna moment, dude. I was I was sitting there going like, I made you a moderator just so you could get rid of him. And I was like, oh, sit. No one's here. Everyone, everyone kind of walked away. I was like, I, I took care of it myself. Don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. I took care of it. Yeah, everyone was asking me, um, what was it? Uh, said that I had trout lips. <laughs> he had poo. I have poo too, dude. Yeah, everyone kept on saying I had trout lips. And uh, asked me if I've ever kissed a girl and all that. So I was just kind of like, really? <laughs> It's another one of my favorites. This is also one of those you either love it or hate it movies, but The Fountain, I saw this in the theater because I'm a real big fan of, well, I was a big fan of uh, Darren Aronofsky at the time because the, uh, there was a rumor going around at this time that he was going to make Batman Year One after this came out. So I was like, definitely got to see it. I saw Pi, his first movie, like super low budget movie he made in the theater. Uh, couldn't really sit through uh, Requiem for a Dream. That movie was just kind of like, uh. No, sorry, No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is not going to be a thing. Um, but this is like a love story that takes place in three different time periods. Um, and the thing is, you don't really know if it's really happening or if it's part of this book that uh, Hugh Jackman's character is writing at the behest of his dead wife. Uh, so there's like the part that takes place in like current day where his wife is dying or uh, Hugh Jackman's wife, uh, Rachel Weiss, is dying of cancer and uh she keeps on saying like you know you need to, to write this thing she was i think she was writing a book and he has to finish it for her and you don't know if the version that, of the storyline that takes place in the past or in the far far future is actually something that is happening or if it's him finishing her story and i think it's really really interesting um i love it a lot it's a fantastic it's brilliantly it looks fantastic like the visual style of it is awesome the remember kind of thing was funny because it was just random these people are coming in here and just being dicks. Uh, here's one of my favorite comedies. It's Friday. <laughs> uh, this is the director's cut. There's really not much more added into it, if I remember correctly. It's maybe a minute's worth of footage. I don't know if it tells me the time codes on each version of it. No, it doesn't really say. It says 97 minutes, but if I remember correctly, that's exactly how long the original version was. But, what, what movie did we get at the video store I was working at? It was, was it Rumble in the Bronx? I think it was Rumble in the Bronx. We got Rumble in the Bronx in, or maybe it was Mortal Kombat. One of them, we had a movie from New Line we watched in the store all the time at the video store I worked at when I was a kid. And there was a trailer for Friday on it, and we would replay the trailer over and over again. Because not only was the music in the trailer really catchy, it was, uh... Oh, jeez, I can't remember the name of the song. Uh, not important. The song that they used over was really catchy, and the jokes were really funny, so we just kept playing the trailer over and over again. Finally, when the movie came out, I was like, this movie had better live up to this trailer. And I saw it on video when it came out, and I was like, okay, yes, it is classic. This movie is so damn funny. It was the first thing I remember seeing Chris Tucker in. Then I realized he was in House Party 3, and I had seen that earlier. I just didn't know who he was back then. But I was like, that guy, I said while I was watching it, that guy is going to be a star. I, I pegged it. I was like, this guy's going to be, this guy's going places. Um, Ice Cube is funny in it too. He's really good. He's like the the straight man of the two, but Chris Tucker is just off the wall crazy, and it just says random shit, and it's funny and super quotable. Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's fantastic. The first movie is still funny because the first movie doesn't reference anything. The second two there was it next Friday and Friday after next. I didn't really find all that funny at all because Chris Tucker number one isn't in them, and they replaced him with uh, Mike Epps, who I don't find very funny. So, I mean, that's just me, though. But I don't find them... They're, like, the two, those two movies combined don't even equal this one. This one is just classic. And it's actually trying to say something about, you know, just living in, like, on, on your street. Like, life on, like, a, a suburban street. You know, the shit that you see every day and take for granted and all that kind of stuff. It's just... It's, it's just a... It's a nice movie on top of it being a really raunchy comedy. It's just... It's, it's hard to explain. It's awesome. And then here's an awesome one. The Frighteners. Uh, Peter Jackson did this right before the Lord of the Rings trilogy. This was what this was like a dry run for all the effects that he was going to need to have available in the law, uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, I saw this in the theater. This was originally supposed to be part of the Tales from the Crypt film series. This was going to be the third one that they made. But they were like, no, uh, the budget you're getting for this is so big it, it does not qualify. We're going to just make it its own movie. 
Is that the bass player from that thing you do on the cover? No, that's Michael J. Fox. <laughs> it's just a really bad Photoshop job of him. It looks like they use the uh, the smooth option on him about 30 times too much. It just looks bad. But it's like a horror comedy. Uh, Michael J. Fox is a psychic. Uh, when he was younger, and with his uh, he was out with his wife. He got into a car accident and she died. But the he took a hit on the head and now he can see he can see like the ghosts around us that we can't see. And he actually befriends a bunch of them and uses them to make money. So he has them go to somebody's house and start throwing stuff around. And then he magically shows up at the door and goes, hey, I'm an exorcist. I can clean out your house for you. $50,000, please. You know, type of thing. But then, like, real bad things start to happen. Like, a real bad ghost shows up and he has to take care of it. It is really great. A lot of really good jokes. Like, uh, Jeffrey Combs is in here. And, like... The look he has in the movie is really creepy, but, like, his performance is just off the rails. It is so much fun. Uh, the special effects are fantastic. And the big finale with, like, Michael J. Fox, like, flying through that Heaven Gate thing is, like, one of the coolest things ever. It's not really scary. I mean, there's there's some parts in it where there's, like... It's not really even that violent. It's like ghost, ghosts killing each other. It's just like, yeah, I, I, I cut the one guy in half and you just see like his two halves go flying. There's no blood or anything. I don't remember there being any blood in this at all. But it's really clever. It's really funny. It's really well acted. It's Peter Jackson. He knows what he's doing. Um, and it's just it's a like it's just a fun horror movie. And I really like it. It's one of my favorites. And this is the uh, director's cut, which is the version you need to watch. They put all the character development that was taken out of the theatrical cut and put it back in. See, Peter, time to go. Get to work. No problem, Ryan. Glad you're uh, enjoying it. Um, I think that uh, Shout Factory or Scream Factory is going to be releasing one of these also, so or a special edition of this, so I might get rid of this too, but I've never opened it because I knew that this is worth a lot of money. It, it was like a limited release, kind of like a limited run games release, but for a Blu-ray, um, and I managed to snag it before it sold out. And that is the original Fright Night, the uh, one from 1985. This is one of my favorite horror movies of all time. I've seen this more times than I can count. Every time I was on cable, I would watch it. Um, after I was actually allowed to watch horror movies back in the uh, day. So it was like anytime after 1988. Um, I watched this all the time. Every time I'd be on cable, I'd watch it. I had a copy of it that we made off of a VHS tape that I would watch all the time. I ended up buying my own copy of it on VHS. I've owned the DVD. I've owned the Blu-ray twice. <laughs> it's a fantastic horror comedy. About a kid who thinks there's a vampire living next door to him and he can't get anyone to believe him. Uh, so he ends up like taking means into his own hands and it's really funny, really uh, like really awesome makeup. It's really well acted. Roddy McDowell's in this and he is just fantastic. He, look, he looks like he's having a freaking ball. Um, Chris Sarandon as the vampire guy, he looks like he's having the time of his life playing a villain. It's super fun, super fast paced. I can't get enough of it. It's still fantastic. And then we have the remake that came out in 2010 or 2011, I want to say. I saw this in the 3D, in theaters, in 3D. And I thought it was okay because it's not a straight remake of the original. It takes the idea of the original and makes it more modern, which is exactly what I wanted. Um, mixes up things with the characters a little bit, which was great. But at the same time, I was like, it's just not nearly as good as the original. So I was kind of disappointed. But I was like, I wasn't telling people it sucked or anything like that. I was just like, it's good, but you're definitely going to be like, I'd rather just watch the original when you're done. But it's worth watching. But I hadn't seen it since I saw it in the theater in 3D. I just kind of never thought about it again. I was just like, you know what, I'll just stick with the original. I'm good. So when I start getting back into buying all these 3D Blu-rays so I can talk about them in videos, I uh, went on eBay and I found a copy of this dirt cheap. And it still came with the uh, slip case with the uh, lenticular cover, which is pretty awesome. You can see Jerry Dandridge moving around. And re-watching this in 3D, I really came to appreciate this as a remake. Because, like I said, it doesn't really... It takes the idea of the first movie and makes it modern. The characters are kind of mixed around. They're all different. Like, uh, Jer or what's his name? Um, Peter Vincent, who Roddy, uh, Roddy McDowell played in the original. He was like an Elvira-type character who was like playing cheap, schlocky horror movies in the middle of the night. And he was like an Elvira-style host who actually was in a couple of horror movies himself back in the day. And But the thing is, he was an act. He was, play, he was an actor who was just hosting a TV show. The kid that thought the vampire was living next to him thinks that because he was killing vampires in the movies, he can kill a real vampire. No, he's an actor. What do you expect? Anyway, 
Uh, in this one, Peter Vincent is David Tennant from Doctor Who, and he's playing the character as an illusionist in Vegas, but is a real occult expert because his his um, stage shows are all about the occult. So the kid, when he finds out that his neighbor's a vampire, goes to him to ask him advice, not really to come and help him kill the vampire. And Peter Vincent kind of gets involved because of that. It's really clever. It's really fun. Um, I hadn't liked Colin Farrell in a movie in the longest time, and he looks like he's having a blast playing the, the uh, villain in here. Sad thing is, Anton Yelchin plays Charlie Brewster, the kid who thinks the vampire's living next door to him, and, you know, he died in, uh, what was it, 2015, uh, right before Star Trek Beyond came out, uh, which really sucks. I would have loved to have seen them make a sequel to this. They kind of did, it went direct to video, and it was absolute garbage. Uh, but Imogen Poots, who plays Amy in, the, in this one, uh, is the most adorable person, uh, the most adorable actress I've ever seen. I think she's absolutely fantastic. And the thing is, she's like in her mid thirties, and she's still playing college students in movies, which is kind of shitty. <laughs> it's like, is that all the roles she can get? The remake of Black Christmas that just came out this past year. She's playing a college student. She's like in her mid thirties. God damn. <laughs> she's playing a high school student in two thousand and ten or two thousand and eleven when Fright Night came out, and in twenty twenty or twenty nineteen, she was playing a college uh, college student. Ugh. He's a good new agent. <laughs> She's way better than that. Anyway, here's another awesome Scream Factory, and that's from Beyond. This is uh, an H.P. Lovecraft movie. Some people go to college late. I'm sure. She looks way too old to be in college in that movie. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is based on an H.P. Lovecraft movie, or sorry, an H.P. Lovecraft book or story. Um, this was one of the um, Empire Pictures movies. Charles Band, before he made Full Moon, Empire Pictures was his, his, uh, his uh, film production company. And this was made for a pretty decent amount of money. I want to say at least two or three million. Uh, Stuart Gordon make this. Uh, Stuart Gordon makes gory ass movies like Reanimator and this and uh, Castle Freak. But the guy hates the sight of blood. But his movies are filled with it. Go figure. But it's a really awesome, twisted, sexually kind of perverse uh, sci-fi horror movie. Um, this inventor guy creates this thing called the Resonator, which stimulates your pineal gland. And when that gets stimulated, you can actually see into another dimension. But the thing is, uh, when you leave it on too long, those things can actually like manifest in reality. Instead of just being like a vision that you can see, they actually come into reality, and bad things start to happen. And it's crazy. Guy starts mutating into this like bubbly beast thing that can change shape and and stuff. And it's just absolutely crazy. People's pineal glands get so stimulated they bust out of their foreheads and like start wiggling around like a little dick coming out of their bridge of their nose. It's a great, creepy, sick, twisted little movie that I absolutely love. I saw this on, like, broadcast television, like a UHF channel, back in the... When it first came out, honestly. When it was, I want to say, maybe two years after it came out in theaters, it was playing on that UHF channel, Channel 50 out here. And I saw, like, the edited version of it. And I was like, that was crazy. I need to watch the un, the uncut version. My parents were like, that is not going to happen. <laughs> and I didn't actually watch it all the way through, like, the original theatrical version. I didn't see that probably till 1990. Anyway. Next up, we got The Fugitive, uh, Harrison Ford. This is one of his biggest hits that he ever did. Uh, this actually came out a couple days after my birthday, whatever year this came out. 93, I want to say. I want to say it was 93. Yep, yeah, 1993, the year I graduated high school. Um, shot mostly in Chicago, too. Go figure. Uh, but it's a remake of a TV show or a film version of a TV show that was pretty popular. I never watched it back in the day. But it's essentially just a long chase scene. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, Harrison Ford is blamed for the murder of his wife and he accidentally escapes from prison during a prison transfer the bus that he's in crashes and he escapes and he's on the run from Tommy Lee Jones for the whole movie trying to prove his innocence it's not a complicated premise but it's really well acted well staged the action scenes are pretty good I like it the performances are great uh, here's a, a hard one to watch and that's uh, Full Metal Jacket Vietnam movie by Oh, let me see if I can remember his name. No, it's not going to happen. Stanley Kubrick, guy did The Shining and Clockwork Orange. Um, I actually prefer this one to uh, Platoon. Uh, they're both great movies, don't get me wrong. I own Platoon also. But this one, it it's, it's good to see the characters, like, when they're in boot camp and they're, like, innocent and they don't know what they're getting, they're getting into when they go to Vietnam. And then, like, you see them just turn into, like, these soulless people by the end of the movie. And it's, like, it's really heartbreaking. And the whole boot camp thing is super hard to watch because of the way Arlie Ermey treats the people and all that. And the whole thing with um, uh, Private Pile and all that. It's just crazy. 
but it's it's a great great movie. It like I said for me it gets kind of it gets to be kind of hard to watch. But I can't stop watching it because I have to finish it every time I put it on. Here's a classic for me and that's Galaxy Quest. Um, I'm a huge Star Trek fan and this is the Star Trek movie we did not know we ever needed or wanted. Uh, it's basically making fun of Star Trek yet honoring it at the same time by having a bunch of people who were on like a Star Trek show back in the 80s uh, now are like all washed up actors they can't really get jobs and all they do is make appearances where they sign autographs and stuff get actually called by legit aliens to help in an intergalactic war because they intercepted the transmissions of the TV show and think that they were actually like historical documents of real wars happening on Earth so they think that the actors are actually like you know intergalactic police and all that it is so fun so clever i love the jokes and it's the characters are all really likable i love um uh, alan rickman in this movie he gets like some of the best lines and i'm not really a big fan of tim allen but this is like one of the few movies where i can actually like tolerate him and actually like him uh but like sigourney weaver as a blonde she is hot as hell like i swear oh my god it's a fantastic movie and it's so freaking funny and clever and as a star trek fan like, I appreciated it. Like, I saw it Christmas Day. It came out Christmas Day. And I actually managed to get a couple of friends and my brother together. We went and saw it in the theater. Grignac! <laughs> How's it going, Freak of Four? Welcome. Um, yeah, we went and saw it Christmas Day. And I kind of knew that it was going to... I thought it was mostly going to be making fun of Star Trek. So I was kind of expecting not to like it. But then I realized that they're actually, like, saying Star Trek is awesome. This would be... Wouldn't it be awesome if William Shatner and... Leonard Nimoy were actually in this movie instead of these characters. Like, we were just, I was just having a blast watching. It was so funny. And they're actually talking about making that into a television series for Amazon now. Like, rebooting it as a television show. Here's another one of my favorite um, David Fincher films. And this is probably the least well-known of his movies. And that is The Game. This came out after Seven. Has Michael Douglas in it and Sean Penn. Uh, basically, Michael Douglas plays like this uber rich guy who has like no life. It's all about work and treating people like shit. Um, his younger brother is Sean Penn, who's like a deadbeat and is always there. Every time they, they meet, Sean Penn's always asking Michael Douglas for money or for some kind of a handout. And all of a sudden, things just start going wrong randomly for Michael Douglas. Like he loses his money and his house gets vandalized. And next thing you know, he's on the run. There's people trying to kill him. And he can't figure it out. His brother gets killed, supposedly. Uh, it's just like, it's crazy. And it turns out to be something else. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin what it is. Uh, but it is really clever and well-written and well-paced and tense. And it's pretty fantastic. Like, the trailers didn't tell you anything about the movie when I saw it in the theater. I remember I saw the trailer where it was basically like a wooden puppet on strings just struggling while you heard dialogue from the movie playing over it. And eventually when he stops moving, you see the line, the, the strings that are holding him up get cut and he falls to his death. And I was like, that is perfect advertising. It makes you want to know what's going on in the movie. And it actually, you hear the dialogue, you kind of get a sense of there's like, you know, oh, he's being uh, hunted by these like soldier type people and all that kind of stuff. It's great. And then you, I watched the movie and I was like, I did not expect it to be like this at all. And it totally blew my mind. So I love this movie. I haven't watched it in forever though. This is the Criterion Collection Edition. So it has tons and tons of extras. Uh, I highly recommend you pick it up. What's up, Cap? How's it going? Here's a funny one. Hey, it's lucky the video game people are here. Guess what I'm going to talk about? Game night. <laughs> um, if you have not seen this movie yet, uh, get off your ass. Go rent it. VOD it. Go get a, the red box and go rent a copy of it. Watch this immediately. So I knew nothing about this movie when it, when it was released in theaters. I basically went to the theater, had a free ticket. I had uh, I have like a regal card and I built up enough points to get a free ticket and I was like whatever movie's playing next I will go see and it was game night and I was like okay whatever I'll go see it I like Jason Bateman I think he's funny let's go and it turns out it's about a group of friends who always have like a game night on Friday nights you know where they play board games and charades and whatever and it turns into like a real life uh like life or death situation type thing uh, because uh, Jason Bateman, his his older brother, or is it his younger brother? I think it's his younger brother. His younger brother is the more well liked of the two of him between the two of the brothers. The uh, his younger brother is the one that everyone likes more. Um, he's seemingly got his shit together. Uh, he invites a, a his, uh, Jason Bateman, his 
girlfriend and, and his little group of game night friends over to his place to have like one of those mystery evenings where like they're like someone gets kidnapped and they have to go and like follow the clues to solve the crime type of thing but it turns out to be real and it is so fun it's like a dark comedy it is so fun so funny there's so many great jokes in here like at the very like the thing that gets me the most is i like rachel mcadams so much when she's doing comedies because she has like real great timing at the very end that henchman is trying to kill her while standing in front of that airplane and the fight is going on in the airplane between Jason Bateman and the, the bad guy. And uh, he gets thrown into the cockpit and hits the throttle. And you see the engine rev up behind the guy trying to kill Rachel McAdams. And he gets sucked in the engine and splats across the, the back wing. And she goes, oh, he died. And it's just, I, oh, God, it is so funny. It is so great. And the whole big twist at the end is awesome, too. There's another one about video games. God damn. Um, I do not like this movie, but I found it. It uh, half price books for like five bucks, and there was like a thing going on when when the three D movies started becoming really popular on home video back in like twenty twelve or thirteen or whatever, where they would take movies that were not even remotely designed to be in three D and to release like a three D Blu Ray version of them that they've been post converted into three D, uh, and one of them is Gamer, uh, the Gerard Butler movie where it's like Grand Theft Auto as a video game movie, um. I didn't really care for it in the theater. I just kind of was bored by it because I was, I, I don't know, just something about it just rubbed me the wrong way. So I didn't really pay much attention to it. But then I saw this, like I said, for five bucks at half price books. And I was like, what the hell? I'll try it again. Watching it in 3D actually made it a better movie. I don't know why. <laughs> it's kind of cool the way they do the 3D in this one because it wasn't just like they, they just post converted it and just like went, here you go. It was like whenever there's something going on in the video gamey world, the 3D is a little bit more like depth perception or like uh you know it's got the depth thing going on um compared to the real world stuff it's really cool the way they did it so i was kind of i was actually going to put this in the videos that i was doing the 3d blu-rays you need to watch on your psvr i was actually going to put this in the first video but i found a movie that knocked it off the 10th place but in 3d i think it's a way better movie than it was in 2d which is really saying something <laughs> for a movie that really was not into the 3d completely changes my opinion on it that's just strange uh, but there's a bunch of movies I have in my collection that are like that, where it's a a movie that had no, it, it, like 3D wasn't even around when it was made and they put it in 3D like Top Gun or Predator or something like that. The Gate. If you guys have never seen The Gate before, like another one, this is another one you need to go out and see. Uh, this came out in the mid 80s. It was Steven Dorff's first movie. He was a little kid in this movie and it's basically about a bunch of kids who open the gate to hell in their backyard. Um, it is really fun, really clever. For a PG-13 movie, this movie will scare the shit out of your kids. Uh, we don't get movies like this anymore. This is like if Goonies were R-rated. Uh, there is so much nasty stuff going on in it. I remember seeing the commercials for it on TV and going like, uh, uh I don't know if I can handle that. But my parents took me to go see it because it was PG-13. I was allowed to see this one. Um, they dropped this off at the Dollar Theater, me and my brother, and it freaked us both out. But I absolutely love this movie. I still watch this one to this day. And you know what the funny thing is? I have never seen the second one all the way through until maybe a month ago. I was putzing around on uh, Amazon Prime, and it's streaming for free if you have Amazon, Amazon Prime. I remember seeing the ads for it in the newspapers when it was playing in the theaters, but I think it was only playing at one theater in the city back when it was first released. It had, like, no release. So I never got a chance to see it, and I remember I caught part of it on cable as a kid, and I just never bothered. It didn't look all that great, the part that I saw. So I finally watched the sequel, which is called Trespassers on Amazon. And it's it's okay, I think. It's not the greatest. The second one is, or the first one is still way better. There's another classic, uh, Gattaca. Uh, this is directed, written and directed by the guy who ended up doing The Truman Show. So uh, it's a, this is a science fiction movie, not a sci-fi movie. It's basically... Everybody is like genetically altered at some point in their life. Like they're when before they're born, people are like the babies are like genetically altered to be perfect when they're born. So anyone who has like been genetically altered before birth is considered like high society. People who are born naturally without any alterations are basically like the lowest of the low. You're not expected to be able to do anything other than being a janitor. Like even if you are super smart. Um, or have great athletic ability, you will never amount to anything because society will not allow you to be anything. Uh, and this uh, one guy that uh, Ethan Hawke plays, 
is a super genius. He wants to work in space travel and space exploration. He wants to go into, into space, but because he was a natural born person, he can't do that. So he ends up finding a guy who is one of these genetic, genetically perfect people who got into a car accident and basically wrecked his, wrecked his legs. He's like paralyzed. He switches places with him. He like ends up having his finger, was his blood? Uh, he has like fake blood packs in his fingertips because they test your blood every day when you go to work to see if you're actually you. Uh, and he pretends to be this guy that is genetically perfect when he isn't. And it's a really cool character study movie. I love it. I saw it in the theater and I was just like, I don't know if I get it. And then, like, I saw it when it came out on home video. I was like, okay, I got you. I got you. We're on the same wavelength now. Here's an awesome horror movie from the last few, the theater. <laughs> I always said going to the movie theater uh, or theater. The movie theater. When I go to see, like, a play or an opera or whatever, it's the theater. It's it's weird. This is the way I was taught when I was a kid. Um, I have a 4K version of Get Out. Uh, this is Jordan Peele's first directorial movie, and it's pretty fantastic i really didn't know what to expect because i think i'd seen one trailer for it and i was like that looks pretty cool i'll probably check it out when it comes out i love jordan peele and you know key and peele was one of my favorite like sketch comedy shows after like Chappelle's show so i was like i'll check it out i want to support the guy you know he's trying to branch out let's do it and i went and see i went and saw in the theater and like the whole time i'm sitting there watching the movie like this i did not expect it to be this good <laughs> i really didn't and there's a lot of like hidden things in there um, things that you don't really think about until like after the fact that have to do with like black culture and stuff um, at the very end when the lead character is like strapped to that chair and they're trying to make him watch that video and they're trying to hypnotize him or whatever or make him go back into the sunken place he uses cotton to stuff in his ears so he can't hear the, the sounds of the person talking to him it's like stuff like that where like I didn't really hit me at first, but when I watched it again, I was sitting there going like, "There's so much stuff like that in this movie. That's awesome." It's like stuff that was like considered bad stuff from the past is actually used to help the guy in present day, which I thought was great. But it's a really awesome like horror thriller. I absolutely love it. I watch that all the time. Wasn't really a big fan of um, of us. Don't I, I don't know why. I just I really couldn't get into it. I think it's just like the whole Hands Across America thing bugged me. I just thought that was kind of cheap and silly. But I love it. Um, I mean, I'll eventually buy Us. I need to watch... Honestly, I will say I need to watch it again. It's one of those movies that you need to watch twice, I think. But I just haven't gotten around to watching it again. I'll pick it up if I find it like at Half Price Books or something. But here's one of my favorite anime of all time. And I got so many people hooked on this when it first came out. Because I was, I was working at that video store when this was released... And I convinced my boss to buy a copy of it. He did not want to buy cartoon movies for adults because that's just stupid. Uh, but it turned out to be like one of the highest rented. We only had one copy of this in the, in the, in the store. Um, I managed to make this like one of the highest rented tapes we had. And we only had like the one copy. And that is the original Ghost in the Shell. Uh, I got this off of Mondo's website. Like Mondo usually releases like art prints and they've been doing like vinyl, like video game soundtracks and movie soundtracks on vinyl. They released this like steelbook version of this. And I've been putting off buying this because there was a previous edition of it that had like horrible CGI enhancements like Star Wars, the special edition style, where they're like CGI enhancing shots. They redubbed it again. And from what I understand, the dubbing was absolutely horrible. So I absolutely refused to purchase it until i can get a copy that had none of that stuff in it i think it was called ghost in the shell 2.0 i refused to buy it until i could find a copy that was the original version that was untampered with and this is it it's a fantastic cyberpunk anime um they made it into a live action movie which i like a lot right here the 3d version which is actually parts from the anime the manga and the different tv shows that have come out over the years like combined into one movie but the anime is fantastic. It's beautiful. The Matrix. Uh, this inspired the, the Wachowskis to make the Matrix. There's stuff in here that is in the Matrix. Like the way that the bad guys land when they jump. Like uh, when the agents jump high up in the air and everybody lands like on their knee and their fist. It's all out of here. Uh, there's so much stuff that they borrowed from the Chosen the Shell. It's fantastic. I absolutely love it. The sequel, anime sequel, is a little too talky when compared to that. And it's not very exciting. But then we have the live action version with Scarlett Johansson. And this was one of those movies that everyone refused to go watch because of whitewashing. Uh, they were like, why would you take a character who in the anime and every other medium that this, you know, thing was available on, 
uh, who's obviously an Asian character, why would you make it a, a white chick? And I had a problem with it too. I was like, there are so many Asian actresses out there that are so freaking awesome. Why are you denying them a job and trying to put friggin' Black Widow in here instead? Then I saw the movie because I was going to see it. I wanted to see how they translated it, you know, to America for American audiences. And they, there's a reason why it's Scarlett Johansson, and it makes sense in the story. So I honestly did not have a problem with it. I still wish it was an Asian character, but or an Asian actress, but we didn't get that. But the reason they give you is actually pretty cool. And the movie is actually a lot of fun. I, I do think it's kind of slow at times. But in 3D, it's beautiful. The whole um, like uh, set, set design and the production design of the whole thing is fantastic. It does borrow a little bit. The funny thing is, watch this and watch Blade Runner 2049 back to back. And you will see that they cross over a lot. Like some of the same shit in here is in Blade Runner. And this came out like a, two years before Blade Runner. I absolutely love it. I mean, I my brother like was like, you're an idiot for buying that movie. How could you actually like it? I'm like, well, because I've I've read the manga. I've seen the movie. I've seen the sequel. I've seen the TV shows. So I know all of the Ghost in the Shell stuff that's out there. I've seen it. I've experienced it. This is like an amalgamation of everything Ghost in the Shell. Everyone thought it was just going to be a live action version of this. No, it's everything that was cool in every other one of those mediums mixed into one live action movie. And it's really awesome, I think. And the fight scenes are great. Uh, no, I don't. I was trying to buy a 3D TV. The idea was to find a, a 4K TV that has 3D capabilities. They are out there. They just don't really advertise them. You really have to like do your research. Uh, but the 3D, the the 4K TV I ended up buying didn't have that. I got it like dirt cheap. And uh, so I was like, okay, I guess I messed out SOL because I've been buying 3D Blu-rays in the anticipation of getting a 3D TV. But then Jason of Corpse Flight Gaming contacts me. He's like, hey, I found a PSVR dirt cheap in Canada. You want it? I was like, uh, yeah. And now I have a way to watch my 3D Blu-rays that I've been buying. So I've kind of like never stopped. I'm still buying them. I still got new ones that I'm getting. Uh, Ghost Ship. I think I need to get rid of this one also because there's a Shout Factory version or Scream Factory version of this coming out. This was um, part of the Dark Castle franchise. Dark Castle was based on the... Fr the uh, What's his name? William Castle was making like horror movies in like the 50s and the 60s. And it started off being the, the Dark Castle series, like Warner Brothers was putting them out. It was like a bunch of remakes of those old William Castle movies. Those Haunt, House on Haunted Hill, the remake of that. Um, there was 13 Ghosts. This was one of them, but this isn't a remake of anything. This is like, like an original movie that they made under that label. And I found this one to be really fun. Um, it has um, Juliana Margulies in it and Gabriel Byrne and Carl Urban. It was like one of the first things I ever saw Carl Urban in. And it's a lot of fun. It's really enjoyable. It's a, it's like a horror thriller about a bunch of people who are murdered on like this cruise ship like the Titanic back in like the 1920s. And the ship has been just out there floating around all this time and these pirates find it and they go to like strip it. And all the ghosts end up trying to kill them all. It's really fun. That opening scene with that wire cutting through everybody is bonkers. I like the friends I saw it with in the theater like all of us were like... <laughs> Because at that time, seeing a horror movie that was actually trying to be like super gory, it was kind of a, a rare thing. I don't remember seeing anything like super gory, like Resident Evil. The original Resident Evil movie was out at the, around that time. Um, oh god, what else was there? And like the original Resident Evil movie is not gory like at all. Yeah, Battle Angel is fantastic in 3D. I have the 4K and 3D Blu-ray set. Yeah, um, yeah, but like I said, it was really cool to see like a movie that was actually gory at that time. Because like I said, a lot of horror movies were trying to skimp on the gore. A lot of PG-13 horror movies were coming out at that time, and now that's kind of like backfired. Those are kind of going away. Thankfully. Here's a cool one. I had no intention of watching this. I thought the trailers made it look really stupid. And then while I was traveling to L.A. to visit my brother, I watched this on the plane. It was one of the movies that was available. So I watched it, and I was like, wow, I'm a freaking idiot. And that's uh, The Gift. This is... Um, Joel Edgerton's directorial debut and it's like a thriller where when he was in high school he was picked on uh, by Jason Bateman's character when they were in high school and he kind of comes across they come across each other again as adults and he starts fucking with Jason Bateman for like revenge and it's like you think one thing is actually happening and it's like completely different like the whole idea of what he's doing to screw with him ends up being completely off of what you think is happening. And I thought it was pretty fantastic and really well made and well written. I was like, Joel Edgerton can build suspense. He knows what's going on. He's been making these like horror movies along the lines. Like he did that The Thing, the Thing prequel and a couple other movies. He's like, he learned some things 
through osmosis, being on set for all these other horror movies, he learned how to build tension correctly, which is kind of awesome. I was really impressed, and I was like, I need to watch another movie he makes, which I think he actually has another one out there. I just haven't watched it yet. Uh, <laughs> it's a movie from my kid when I was a kid. That's the G.I. Joe animated movie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because of what happened with the Transformers animated movie where they killed Optimus Prime and it, like, like, scarred children for years when they happened, that happened, uh, the idea behind this one was it was gonna be the transition between the old line of G.I. Joe toys and the new line of G.I. Joe toys, kind of like the same way the Transformers movie was. They were gonna kill off Duke in this one. And there's a scene where he gets, like, stabbed with Serpentor's, uh, one of his snake, uh, spears. And he was gonna die, but then the backlash that they got because of optimus prime getting killed in the transformers movie made them go back and reanimate the stuff so he lives at the end and <laughs> they killed the plan that they had but this one isn't nearly as good as the transformers movie this one feels more like uh, a tv miniseries and i remember it was broad i don't remember this ever coming to the theaters like the way the transformers movie did uh, because I remember seeing this first on TV. It was like split up into like four or five parts and was played every day, once a day for a week. Like you saw every part like over the course of a week. And when you put it all together, it kind of works, but it still feels just like an extended version of the TV show instead of like a real movie like the Transformers one was. But it's still pretty fun. And that opening animation scene where Cobra's trying to blow up the Statue of Liberty and G.I. Joe stops them. The song that they play over that scene is so freaking awesome. It's ridiculous, but it's awesome. And the animation is really good that it pisses me off that the rest of the movie didn't look as good as that opening scene. But it's pretty... It's, it's, a, it's a movie from my childhood. I can't get enough of it. Here's an awesome one. Uh, Go. This is the... Uh, I used to call this the Teeny Bopper Pulp Fiction. Uh, this is by Doug Lyman, the guy who did the first Born Identity. He did uh, Edge of Tomorrow, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, this was the first movie I remember him doing. I saw this in the theater because I was a big fan of Sarah Polly. So I wanted to see like a big, her like first big movie in a long time. Oh my God, dude, you need, if you're a fan of G.I. Joe from back in the day, you need to see it. Uh, Burgess Meredith plays the bad, the new bad guy in it. <laughs> and you got bad guys running around going, Cobra, la, 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 la. It makes no sense. It's, it's crazy, but it's awesome. But this is basically like Pulp Fiction with a bunch of teenagers in it. It's a bunch of kids that go to a rave. Uh, one of the girls tries to sell fake ecstasy there, screws a drug dealer out of his own ecstasy. He goes there to kill her. And it's like all these, character, these characters kind of like pass each other at one point in the movie. And then you get to see their part of the story out of order from everything else. Like I said, it's like Pulp Fiction. And it's actually really well done. It's really fun, really fast-paced. It's got a great soundtrack. Um, a lot of stars. People ended up who were nobodies back then, like, became stars from this movie. Like, uh, what's her name? Um, Katie Holmes. Like, she had just started Dawson's Creek when this came out, I think. So, yeah. Timothy Oliphant was in this. This is one of the first things I saw Timothy Oliphant in. He plays the drug dealer. It's awesome. Okay, this one is shit, but it's fun shit. Uh, and I bought it because 3D. I never got to see this in 3D in the theater, but because um, my friends that I always go, I usually go see movies with, they 3D messes with their heads. Like it, it, they, 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 they get headaches from it. So I always end up having to see those kind of movies by myself. But this is Gods of Egypt. Um, I picked this one up at Half Price Books. I think this was also like five dollars for the 3D Blu-ray of it. And I wanted to watch this again uh, just to see what the 3D was like. And uh, when I saw it in the theater, I honestly I fell asleep. Uh, I was, we saw it, I think really late at night and, um, I was really tired from work. I fell asleep for, I think maybe like 20 minutes in the middle somewhere. So I missed a good chunk of it, but I was kind of not really into it at the start and the stuff I saw after the, after the uh, part where I fell asleep, I was kind of like, eh, whatever. I don't understand what's going on. Whatever. I need a drink. My throat's going dry. So I kind of wanted to watch the movie all over again so I could see the whole thing, but I didn't really enjoy it in the theater and it's a cheese ball like overproduced movie like it's like you got this corny cheesy premise and let's just like throw millions and millions and millions of dollars at it thinking that it'll be better because of that and no it's basically um nikolai coster waldau from game of thrones guy who plays jamie lannister he's the heir to the throne of egypt and like these uh he's a god the gods actually walk among the people and they're like 12 feet tall and uh, he's supposed to like inherit the throne from his father 
And then his brother shows up, and that's Gerard Butler. And Gerard Butler, like, kills the father, tries to kill Jamie Lannister, and uh, takes over the throne. And Jamie Lannister is like, he loses an eye. He ends up going out into the desert and exiles himself. And then, like, a bunch of people from it's the town. I can't remember what city they were at. Um, they, like, rebel and try to find Jamie Coster while not bring him back. I keep calling him Jamie. It's Nikolai. Yeah. Uh, they try to bring him back to, like, fight his brother again so he can, like, take the throne because um, uh, Gerard Butler's a dick. And he, like, it's basically he's just doing it because he's having an ego trip. And uh, Nikolai's the, the good ruler guy and they want to have him take over the throne. It's really stupid. It's kind of like trying to be, like, the Egyptian version of uh, Clash of the Titans. And it's just nothing but crazy, stupid, cheesy special effects. But in 3D, it kind of works. Uh, like I said, I wasn't really enjoying it when I saw it in the theater. But when I watched it in 3D in my PSVR, I was like, it's kind of okay. Uh, the guy who did The Crow and iRobot and Dark City directed this. I think he's kind of going in the wrong direction for his career. I think he needs to start making like smarter movies instead of making dumber, progressively dumber and dumber movies. Uh, like his high, I think his, he peaked with Dark City. And from then on, he's kind of been on this downward slope. And I was like, dude, if you keep making, making movies like this, your career is going to be over before you know it. Uh, he needs to, like, up his game a little bit. But, I mean, like, if you like Clash of the Titans, you're going to like this. Okay, so now we've got nothing but Godzilla movies. Lots and lots of Godzilla movies. <laughs> uh, I have the original Godzilla, or Gojira. Uh, this is the Criterion Collection version. I found this at Half Price Books for, like, $10. I get so lucky... When I go to Half Price Books, I don't get it. Uh, but this is the original black and white one. The version without Raymond Burr in it. And it, I love that it's got the little pop-up Godzilla thing in it. That is so cool. When I saw when I was checking this out to make sure that it was complete, and I saw that happen, I was like, this is coming home with me. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's coming home with me. Um, I saw this for the first time ever in the theater. The music box was playing the original Godzilla, the original Japanese version, subtitled in the theater and I was like for the first time for seeing this this you know classic you know I want to see it that way in the theater and my friend and I were both like that's kind of awesome it's trying to say something about like Hiroshima and all that kind of stuff and like the consequences and uh it's actually a pretty cool monster movie yeah it's cheap as shit but what do you expect but it ended up spawning non-stop sequels for decades and decades and decades and really bad American remakes uh, except for the recent ones, I like those. Uh, but I have the remake from, what is it, 20, 2014, I want to say. Uh, yeah, this is the remake of the remake. Uh, and I never got a chance to see this in 3D back when it was first released because everyone I saw with couldn't handle it. Uh, watching it in 3D on my PSVR was pretty fantastic. Um, I like this one a lot. I like the fact that whenever you see Godzilla fighting or something like that, except for like the finale part, but like during the course of the movie... It's always from somebody filming it with a with a camera, like a cell phone, or it's a news report, and you just kind of see like the feet bouncing around or whatever. Or you might get a shot of Godzilla's face or the one of the the Muto's faces or whatever. And I just thought that was really clever because everyone seems to think that because the movie's called Godzilla, you're gonna see Godzilla the entire movie. Have you ever watched one of the originals? Godzilla shows up at the beginning, gets into a like a you know starts trashing Tokyo or whatever, disappears for half the movie. And then comes back at the very end for a fight with whatever monster they're introducing in it. That's the way these movies work. So when I heard everyone complaining that Godzilla's barely in the movie, I'm like, yeah, have you ever watched a Godzilla movie ever? He's usually barely in them. But I, I really like the way they changed the way he looked in here. He looked, like, mean. And I like the whole fact that he's, like, the enforcer Godzilla instead of, like, a bad guy. He's actually here to protect us. Just so happens to destroy lots of property in the process. I thought it was pretty awesome. I couldn't, uh... I couldn't be more happy with this. I know a lot of people hated it. I was not one of them. I liked it a lot. And then we have Godzilla 2000. This one actually came out in the year 2000. I saw this in the theater with a bunch of friends. And this is, I think, the last one of the Japanese ones that I remember getting a theatrical release. No, I did see Shin Godzilla, so I take that back. Um, this one I thought was pretty fun. I like this one a lot. This one has the... Uh, what was it called? It starts on O... It's like a UFO that ends up turning into like a big monster that like tries to eat Godzilla's head. Um, this is the first of the classic Godzilla movies I ever saw in the theater, like the Japanese ones. Uh, and then like I want to say three or four years later is when I saw the original one in the theater. 
Uh, but this one was pretty fantastic. This has the uh, Japanese and U.S. version, so you can watch it subtitled or dubbed. I'd rather watch it dubbed. It's funnier that way. But the special effects, the models, uh, the Tokyo being destroyed and all that is pretty awesome. But the costume for Godzilla in this one's pretty awesome. I like it a lot. And then we have the sequel to the American remake from 2014, and that's uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. I had to get this from Korea. I had to get this because we did not, we did not get a 3D Blu-ray version of this in America. We just got either the Blu-ray or the 4K Blu-ray. So I wanted to get the 4K and Blu-ray 3D combo, and the only place I can get it from was off of eBay from Korea. And it took like three months for it to get here. I ordered it at the uh, I ordered it at the beginning of March off of eBay, and it didn't get here until I think the end of May. I ordered like three movies, and they didn't get here till the end of May, which was crazy. But I saw this in the theater uh, with a bunch of friends. Didn't see it in 3D there either because I saw it with the same people that can't do the 3D. And it blew my mind. I was like, how did this movie get made? This movie is just nothing but things blowing up. How much money did, how much money did this movie cost? Like, I cannot believe that somebody actually made this movie. Because it was like reminding me of the old school, like the Destroy All Monsters Godzilla, you know, combo movie that came out back in the 60s. Where it was like all the, the monsters that Godzilla has fought at that point in time all converge on him at one time. And they have a big old battle royale. And I was like, this movie must have cost $300 million. Turns out it didn't. <laughs> but I absolutely loved it. I was just, I had a smile on my face the whole time. It was like bringing me back to my childhood watching these movies on like a UHF station, like on a Sunday. Absolutely couldn't get enough of it. I thought it was fantastic. And they set it up for the movie that was supposed to come out this summer, which is the follow up to this. And it was Godzilla vs. King Kong. Uh, and because of, you know, the plague, it got delayed until next summer now, which is kind of shitty. I was really looking forward to that this summer. Uh, gonna have to wait, but whatever. But actually, it's surprising that they actually went through with the King Kong and Godzilla thing because this kind of underperformed, if I remember correctly. It didn't perform nearly as well as they thought. But I thought it was fantastic. I couldn't get enough of it. And then I have these double features that I found at Half Price Books. Uh, I have Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack. That's the whole title for one movie. And Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Uh, these are the ones that came out in the 90s. And then I also have Godzilla, Tokyo SOS, and Godzilla Final Wars. Final Wars was supposedly the final Japanese Godzilla movie. Like, they were just going to end it there. I think it was like the 20th movie that they'd made or something. And they were just like, yeah, this is it. And it was directed by the guy who did um, Versus. If you ever seen Versus, watch that immediately. It's a Japanese zombie Yakuza martial arts movie. <laughs> and it's kind of awesome. Uh, oh, what's his freaking name? Ryuhei Kitamura. He did the Midnight Meat Train. He did uh, a couple other movies I've seen. Um, shit. He made that one American movie that was absolutely god-awful that I watched. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, but basically he did Versus and a couple of other anime-style movies. And they were like, we need your expertise in ending this Godzilla franchise. And it's basically like an amped-up version of uh, Destroy All Monsters. Where it's Godzilla versus like every creature that he's ever fought in a movie at once. And he even fights the Godzilla from Roland Emmerich's movie from the 90s and kills it in like 30 seconds. Like they basically run at each other. The Japanese Godzilla picks up the, the American one and throws him into like a building and then shoots him with his blast and he's dead. It is so awesome. Uh, but I haven't watched the Tokyo Godzilla one. I wanted this mostly for Final Wars. And out of the two of these, the only ones that I've seen is Mechagilla, Mecha God, oh, Jesus. Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla. And they're both pretty fun. I saw, I rented both of those on VHS actually. But I can't get enough of those either. Let me get those first. And we're in the home stretch, people. And once again, I've gone over two hours, which was not my goal. More Bond movies. I have Goldeneye and Goldfinger. Goldeneye is the soft reboot of Bond. Uh, when uh, the Timothy Dalton movies underperformed, they fired uh, Timothy Dalton, which was a sad, sad day for me because I love the Timothy Dalton ones. Um, and they waited like four or five years to make another one, and they rebooted it with pierce brosnan and it revitalized the whole franchise because they finally brought it out of the dark ages and made it modern with cgi and you know stupid jokes and stuff and pierce brosnan made a pretty good bond at least at first he did and this was one of my favorite bond movies also i think it's great and it spawned that video game that everybody loved in the 90s <laughs> for the nintendo 64 which i can't stand uh and then we have gold finger which is the third bond movie from back in the day uh, the third one with Sean Connery in it. And this one is pretty fantastic also. This is where, like, the fran the uh, formula really started to kick in. 
and they knew that they had gold. I mean, this one made tons of money. This was like the highest grossing movie, I think, of the year, the year that this came out. It's fantastic. Uh, great villain and all that. And this is one of the only, out of all the movies that Sean Connery did as Bond, this is like one of two that I like that he did. I only like this one and From Russia With Love, and I can't really stand the others. Uh, Gone Baby Gone. This is uh, Ben Affleck's directorial debut, I think. Yeah, this is directorial. It's a police procedural about a, a kid that disappeared. It's actually really, really good. I honestly haven't watched it since I first rented it uh, from the Red Box. And I picked it up not too long after at a half price books because it was cheap. And I was like, I need to watch that again. I thought it was fantastic. I haven't watched it, so I honestly cannot remember all that much about it. But I remember loving it when I saw it uh, from the Red Box. Okay, and here's one I bought just so I could have the complete collection for the franchise. Uh, I think they're rebooting the franchise now because this effectively killed the series. And that's uh, A Good Day to Die Hard. This is the fifth Die Hard movie. This is the extended cut. Uh, another one where they were like, hey, for the theatrical version, let's get as many butts in the seats as we possibly can and make it PG-13 and just kill everything about the original three Die Hard movies that everybody liked. Um, so barely any cursing, barely any violence. It's basically all about the stunts. I think it worked in Live Free or Die Hard that they focus more on making the stunts really cool and instead of like the blood and gore. But this one was just, I hate the guy who directed this. I really do. Every movie he's made, I've hated um, what's his name? John, John Moore. He did, uh, Behind Enemy Lines, the one with, uh, Gene Hackman and, uh, Owen Wilson. Can't stand it. It uh, looks cool, but there's nothing going on. He made Max Payne, and he did the remake of The Omen. I have not liked any of his movies, and when I heard that they hired him for this, I was like, well, the franchise is over now. It's over as we know it. And I was right. It's like, it's the shortest movie of the franchise. I think the movie itself, when you take out the end credits, is like 80 minutes long. It has awesome stunts and some awesome cinematography, but it's just Bruce Willis going like, give me my paycheck. And looks like they're trying to pass the torch off to his son, played by uh, Jai Courtney. And it's like, no, just just end it here. It's just not a good movie at all. It's not good. It's not Die Hard. I don't like it. I don't like it. All those Bond sets? Yeah, the hell with that shit. Uh, then I have uh, Goodfellas, my favorite... Uh, Martin Scorsese movie and I've probably seen this maybe like five times in my lifetime because I'll watch it and I'll be like that was awesome I think I'm okay with gangster movies for a while uh, but everything I love uh, I love about gangster movies is in here it's great performances it's filmed great it's got great music uh, and Martin Scorsese like excels when he makes these gangster movies although I still haven't watched that newest one that he did for Netflix because I hear it is like so overdone it's just like there's flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks it's like no uh, but Goodfellas is one of my all-time favorite ones. I could watch that. I wouldn't say any time, but if I were to be... If I were told, hey, let's watch a gangster movie, I'd probably put that on as the first one. And here's an awesome one. This is another one either you're going to love it or you hate it. I loved it. It's Gravity. This is the 3D version. So, I won a free ticket to see this in the theater like two weeks before it came out on the IMAX. And the thing about uh, this was, when I saw the trailers, I was like... I told my friends, I was like, I'm guaranteeing you that Gravity is going to be the scariest movie you see all year. What's up, Jaguar? How's it going? Uh, I was like, Gravity is going to be the scariest movie I see all year. And they were like, how's that? I was like, what can you do when there's no options left? Here? There's nothing you can do in space to help you. You get, Like, you see that uh, um, Sandra Bullock gets, like, thrown away from the Earth. What do you do? It's like being at the bottom of the ocean. What can you do? There's nothing you can do to help yourself. So I was like, it's just a terrifying idea, getting like lost in space. And in 3D, it is absolutely fantastic. Honestly, the movie's a big cartoon. The only thing that's real in this movie is like, there's some scenes where Sandra Bullock is like outside of her spacesuit, like when she's in the space stations and stuff. That's real. But for the most part, all you're seeing is like their face. Their face is the only thing real in any of those shots when they're in outer space. Their their uh, spacesuits. The environments, everything about it is CGI. It's just their face that's real. So it's kind of like a cartoon. It's awesome. It is frightening. Uh, there is some stupid stuff that happens in it. But the 3D is so well designed. And, uh, like, there was a couple of times where, like, the debris attacks, when the debris stuff happens, that uh, takes out the space shuttle at the beginning and the, uh, the, the uh, telescope that they're trying to fix at the very beginning, little bits of debris, like, 
come right at your face. And, like, you don't even see it coming. It's just all of a sudden you see this black mark in your face. And I flinch every single time I watch it because it just takes you by surprise. But the 3D is so well thought out. The music in the movie is absolutely fantastic. The music that plays over the end of the movie, like, uh, when Sandra Bullock gets back to Earth... The music that plays, it's like almost like a cathartic thing. It's like she wants to be screaming that she's, you know, that she lived. The music's doing it for her. And it's just, it just works. It's so well made. I love it. It's it's a great 3D movie. And just, even in 2D, it's fantastic. All right, I'll talk to you later, uh, Freak of Four. Thanks for coming. And thanks for coming. I don't give a thumb. Oh, I, I highly recommend Gravity. Check it out. It is fantastic. I own this because I'm a fan of the comic books and nothing more. I got this dirt cheap somewhere and I was like, whatever. Uh, and that is the Green Lantern movie with Ryan Reynolds. This is the extended cut. It is better than the theatrical cut. They actually put the motivations behind the bad guy, like why he hates Hell uh, Jordan in this. Uh, there's like this whole thing when they were kids. And it sets up the whole thing really well. Although the whole Parallax thing is bullshit. That's not Parallax. That's Parallax is Hell Jordan. It's not like some separate entity thing. It's so stupid. Uh, Ryan Reynolds was the wrong person to play Green Lantern. Uh, Hal Jordan is not the jokey Green Lantern. That's Kyle Rayner. Uh, they should have gotten like... Uh, uh, what's his name from uh, Firefly? Nathan Fillion to play. Oh, I thought you were... Okay, never mind Freak of Four. My bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, wa I was really hoping this would be good. Because I'm a huge Green Lantern fan. I have tons and tons of of graphic novels of Green Lantern in my uh, li my library. So I was really looking forward to it, and I was hoping... I didn't like the casting of Ryan Reynolds in it, and I was just like, I'm hoping for the best. And so I went and saw it with a bunch of friends, and when it wa we walked out, we were just like, what? <laughs> who thought that was a good idea? And the guy who directed Goldeneye and Casino Royale directed this, and I was like, he couldn't even fix this. He was the guy that was known for fixing the broken franchises, and he couldn't even kick one off. And I, we were just like, I was like so mad. But the thing was... I owned, before this came out, I bought a copy of Green Lantern First Flight, one of the DC animated directed video movies. So when this ended, my friends weren't really familiar with Green Lantern. They knew basically basic things about the character. So when this ended, they were like, well, okay. And I was like, how about we go back to my place and we watch the real Green Lantern movie? And basically when this ended, so this movie's like two hours and 14 minutes long. Or sorry, 114 minutes. So it's just shy of two hours. The theatrical cut. This is 77 minutes. So when this ended, my friends looked at me and they were like, this movie covered all the ground and more that the live action movie did in half the time. So if you want to watch like the real Green Lantern origin movie, watch Green Lantern First Flight. It's fantastic. This, not so much. But like I said, I'm a huge Green Lantern fan, so that's why that's in my collection. And then the other one I have is Green Lantern Emerald Knights. And I don't remember a lot about this one. I think it's a whole bunch of short stories about Green Lantern characters. I think that's what this one was. It's been I think I watched it the one time and I was just kind of like, eh, it's alright. I didn't really commit it to memory. Uh, but First Flight's the awesome one. First Flight's the one I highly recommend you pick up if you're into that. Uh, next up we have Green Zone, which is like a military action thriller type movie with Matt Damon. Same guy who directed the last three born no last four born movies uh directed this one and i remember watching it i rented it from the red box and or no sorry netflix uh I, I got a disc and i watched it and i was like that was pretty awesome i liked that a lot and then i found a used copy of it and i bought it i haven't watched it since i saw that uh version from netflix so i kind of need to sit down and watch it again because honestly i couldn't tell you anything about it <laughs> I just totally have brain farted on that. I do not remember anything about it. I just remember liking it a lot when I first saw it, and then that was it. Okay, so this one... Oh, we only got like three more people. Three more. Three more to go. Um, this one, I actually waited. I never bought anything related to this until I could get this like complete version of it. Kind of like the way I am with uh, video games. <laughs> you know who Green Lantern is. <laughs> um, we're talking Grindhouse. So... Grindhouse came out in 2007, I do believe. Either 2000 or 2007 or 2008. And it's basically two movies crammed into one. It's, you know, one of them is directed by Robert Rodriguez, and that's called Planet Terror. And there's one by Quentin Tarantino that's called uh, Death Proof. 
And it was like those old uh, grindhouse theaters where it was like you get a double feature. They were trying to recreate that whole 1970s grindhouse theater thing by having these two like cheapy, um, like independent, you know, cheap budget movies uh, crammed together. And you got a whole bunch of trailers for fake movies with them too. And uh, I went and saw it with a friend of mine and we were blown away. I was like, I, I preferred the Quentin Tarantino movie. I preferred Death Proof over Planet Terror. Uh, cause Planet Terror was basically, it's a zombie movie, but it's like, let's see how over the top we can possibly get. A girl gets her leg ripped off by a zombie and a machine gun put in its place. And as she's walking, she'll shoot a rocket out of the machine gun and it'll propel her into the air. And she's like flying around shooting people in the air with her machine gun leg. It's so silly, but it's fun. I mean, it's just supposed to be like a cheap, cheesy movie. Like, you know, those old grindhouse movies. And then you got Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof, which is like the serious one about, a bunch of uh, actresses and stunt women who are working on a movie end up uh, getting hunted by a guy who kills people with his car, and it's Kurt Russell. And that was the the more serious of the two, and that's the one I preferred because the stunts in it are fantastic. There's that whole scene with uh, uh, Zoe Bell, who's a real stunt woman in real life. She was uh, Uma Thurman's stunt woman in the Kill Bill movies. Uh, her strapped to the, the hood of that uh, that sports car that they take it for a test drive, and then Kurt Russell tries to kill them while she's on the hood. And there's like, there's like at least 13 times where she looks like she's about to fall off that freaking hood and die. And it's just really, stunts are really well done. It's really great. And then it ends on a really funny note, <laughs> which takes you by surprise. Uh, but yeah, Planet of Terror is like, eh. But the thing was, when these came out on home video, they split the movies up. So you could either get Planet Terror separately or you had to get Death Proof separately. You, you, they did not put them together like they were in the theater. And I said, fuck that. I saw the movie as the double feature in the theater. That's the experience I want at home, too. I'm not buying these movies separate. That's bullshit. Why would you do that? That was just the Weinsteins trying to, like, get as much money from the fans as possible. It's like double dipping. So I was like, the hell with you guys. I'm not giving you my money until I get the whole complete thing. And then eventually they release, like, the double feature version where it has all the commercials for the fake movies like Machete and the, was it the Thanksgiving Day uh, movie, whatever it was, where the, the girl does the splits on the trampoline and the knife comes through the trampoline and she... Her crotch lands on the knife. It's freaking crazy. Um, and then don't. <laughs> so I'm super happy that I was finally able to get like the complete package thing. Because that was just... I was so mad that the wine scenes decided to split it up like that. And then the last two things I have to talk about today are the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Uh, both of them are in 3D. I did get the Best Buy exclusive 3D steelbook. Um, I actually had to order this over the website and then have it ready for pickup at the Best Buy by my house. Um, but I absolutely love both of these movies. But if I were to pick one uh, as my favorite, I think I'd have to pick part two. Part one is great. Don't get me wrong. It's really funny, clever. Uh, I love all the characters. But the thing about part two is part two is actually saying something about, like, bad parenting. Um, there's uh, Lindsay Ellis. Uh, I think she was the nostalgia chick on the, the channel Awesome. She did a video about the themes of this one and i was like that's exactly the kind of stuff that was going through my head when i was watching it because you got like all this bad parenting stuff going on and uh you know people forgiving each other for shit they did in the past type of stuff and i was just like it's a deeper movie than just being a, a, a superhero movie there's actually some stuff being said and she said it all and then james gunn the guy who directed the movie saw the video and actually commented on it and says well done <laughs> i was like that's awesome but yeah uh guardians of the galaxy 2 is probably tied for my number two spot for favorite uh, Marvel movies. It's tied with uh, Captain America Winter Soldier. Uh, I think that's fantastic. My favorite is still probably Doctor Strange. Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Like seriously just watch it. It's so good. It's so good. And like I said it's, it's actually saying something. Instead of just being about superhero shenanigans. Uh, so that's it for tonight. Once again I went way past my two hour limit. Dumbass. <laughs> you can't help it i start talking movies and it just shit happens um so thank you very much for coming tonight next week i'll be back on thursday with another one of these and it will be what is it h through j maybe or something like that we'll see maybe h through k uh hk hunter killers from terminator Arr! anyway um yeah come back for that next thursday 7 p.m central i'll be back for that and this month i'm actually going to have a pickup stream i didn't have one in may because in the whole of may i bought two video games and i was not going to stream 
talking about two video games, that stream would be four minutes long. And I was like, no. Uh, so this month, actually, I've gotten quite a lot of games. If you've been you know, following my Instagram or my Facebook page, you have seen the stuff that I've picked up. And I have another big stack of stuff in the other room that it's going to be shown off this weekend, too. So goddamn. <laughs> so I will have plenty to talk about. So that will probably be next Tuesday, uh, 7 p.m. for the May slash June pickup combo stream. So I hope to see you guys there, too. Um, and then uh, I'm actually, now that sh the movie's starting, the, the third season is over, and I've got like a little bit of a break where I don't have to worry about scheduling guests for a little while and editing the episodes together, I can actually start working on edited content again. So I'm going to start working on that Captain Algebra video, the uh, top 10 NES games. So, yeah, I've said that every single stream, and it's never happened, but trust me, it's happening now because now I actually do have some time to do it. And I've got garbage and pieces of plastic from opening these packages and stuff all over the place anyway thanks for coming everybody um i really appreciate everybody coming to check out the stream and i'll talk to you next time chris the old ass retro gamer signing off stay safe out there everybody please don't forget to wear your masks and wash your hands do it for me i care uh talk